Time for s what the <laughs> fucking f it's time for season fucking two of that's the fucking trailer and this is the fucking coffin. <laughs> What the fuck is up, internets? Welcome to season two of That Is The F***ing Trailer. Trying to drop the deuce on their ass. That's right, guys. Listen here. Something's new here. Something just feels a little... The ambiance is different. Bask in the ambiance. It feels cleaner. It feels tighter. It's, it's like the layout, man. Check, check it out, man. What we did was we hired a graphics guy, and I'm completely lying. No, we just went to a new layout, guys, with everything just like with your film. Your second film shouldn't look like your first film. It should look better. And this is season two of TTFT. We're better. You're better for what we taught you last season. So, hey, check us out. It's nice. It's nice around here. No. Cleaned up real nice. You know what, man? You're a cool dude. <laughs> Wanted to give a shout out to Andrew Hence for being our solo Patreon. If you would like to join Andrew in being a Patreon, a patron of TTFT, please visit the link that's coming up somewhere on the screen right about now. We will be posting episodes early, so if you are Andrew Hence and you have become a patron of the show, then you are watching it before Thursday. And you're also watching it completely uncensored. So, so if you I say f you, they actually hear me saying f you and not yes so and, you. and if i were to say something like you would hear that in all of its <laughs> glory why did you have that ready to go loaded why did you say <laughs> for your old virgin which ah. brings us back to sunny fit full circle love it yep um coming up in the show we have three guests for our cast crew are you this segment we will be joined by David McGifford. The, um, we actually talked to David during the finale of our last season uh, when he came on for Rain Man. He was also the AD on Vanilla Sky. We'll also be talking to Michael G. Kehoe, who is a writer-director himself, but he also uh, is in the culinary arts for the film industry. He handled the craft service on Vanilla Sky and a number of other Tom Cruise films, but he was not credited for that in Vanilla Sky. He was actually credited for being a chef in the actual movie. Hmm. So that'll be interesting. We'll get into that. We'll also talk to Johnny Fedovich. He, he starred in the film as well. He played, he uh, reprised his role uh, from a previous Cameron Crowe film, Almost Famous. Um, he has a little cameo in Vanilla Sky. It's a call back to that. So we will discuss that with him. Stick around for Cast Crew Are You. All that will be coming up, and so this episode, we are covering Vanilla Sky. Yes, we are. Vanilla Sky, a an acquired taste, a film of acquired taste. You know what? We don't even have to get into it. Let's get uh, Brandon P. Carlos, Lil P. What's the name we're giving him? Uh, I would just call him, we call him Special K. Special K? Yeah. All right. Yes. We are going to be- Everybody uh, hates Special K. Let's get Special K on the line real quick to give us a elevator pitch on Vanilla Sky. For those who hasn't, have not seen it, you can get you can catch up to where we are before we get into everything that we're about to get into. Take it away, K. Hello. Hello. Tell the audience uh, what you do besides what you're about to do. Uh, I I I don't normally do this. I uh, I, I'm a designer of. Basically, any form of media you need designed, and that's what I do for money. Well, f money. What do you do? What 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 qualifications are you bringing to the table? I was on a film podcast for I don't know a couple of years, and then that got disbanded, and I've never like stopped being really mean about movies and things. So I kind of just this seemed like a pretty good segment for me to come in and tear down some things. There we go, and <laughs> tear down. I want you to do. <sighs> In an elevator pitch, is kind of, it's kind of hard to pitch a movie that you don't like. <laughs> so Vanilla Sky is based off of uh, Open Your Eyes, which was a Spanish foreign film. And it also had Penelope Cruz in it, which is pretty dope. Her titties do not get enough attention or accreditation. or uh, They're just, they're nice. They're nice as hell. Anyway, so we open up and there's New York City. We see like stereotypical, like I, I would say drone shots, but it was shot in the early 2000s. So that didn't really, that's not a thing yet. We meet David, who's a rich ass 
trust fund kid. Basically, they should call it Vanilla Sky or you need to tax rich people. Um, so we hear uh, the words, open your eyes, open your eyes, open your eyes. You see Tom Cruise in bed. He goes and unplugs, like, gets a f***ing plucks of gray hair or whatever. Goes to Times Square in a Porsche, which is a really nice car. That scene's, that sequence is pretty cool. We cut to a weird f***ing random thing where Kurt Russell's sitting there talking to the f***ing Phantom of the Opera. And they're sitting there just talking back and forth about, like, whatever. And so far, I'm not intrigued, and so far, I don't care. Then we cut back to the real world where, uh... David's having a party for his birthday and he's like walking around being like, look at all my fancy shit, because I'm a rich guy. Look at all my fancy rich guy shit. And Brian Brody, as people know him from other things, Brody shows up and he's brought, he's got Penelope Cruz with him. And her name is Sophia in this, but then there's some cute future about who's who. They have the party. Uh, you can tell they're kind of interested in one another. So then event, like I guess later that night, as far as the timeline is concerned, he goes back to Sophie's place. Oh, by the way, this whole time he's in this bitch named Julie. And Julie wasn't even invited to the party even though he in her mouth. They have a really interesting uh, like back and forth. They're, they're people from two, two different worlds. They never, they, I guess they don't have sex. It's not really that, impl it's not implied between Sophie and David whether they have sex. So I'm just gonna say they didn't because she seems like she's not that kind of girl. Next morning, we're 45, we're almost 45 minutes in the movie at this point. Julie is in, a car and she's like, David, you come with me, get in the car. So he gets in the car, they're driving and she's freaking out because apparently the four times and in somebody's mouth doesn't mean anything to David. I mean, why should it? There's no children involved. She goes crazy, they fight over the steering wheel and then Julie dies in a car accident and David is in uh, a coma for three weeks. David wakes up from that coma and he's kind of like, I, I, at this point we're kind of confused on like what is dream, what is coma, comatoseness. David's disfigured, right? He gets out of the hospital. He has this weird dream sequence that has to deal with Sophia. And then he goes to a nightclub to meet up with Brody and Sophia and he tries to hit on Sophia after in his mind thinking that night they had where they were like there was tension and then whatever then he got in a car accident and so he's like pulling on that meanwhile in his comatose state he had like this almost not an entire relationship with sophia but he had a little bit more the more of an inkling of what's up with sophia so they go to the bar uh they're on the same side of the bar at one point but then they're on the other end of the fucking bar club and he's just sitting over here just taking shots with his fucking fan of the opera mask with the bartender. And at this, at this point, Tom Cruise, uh, AKA David is just fucked out of his mind. And then I guess Brody and Sophia distance themselves from him bar wise, like I was saying earlier. And so he goes over there to like talk to them. I don't know how long the time has been since he's been doing like 30 shots with the bartender. It seems like it was the entire evening was spent over there, but he goes back over there. He face, he tries hitting on Sophia. Brian's like, ah, Sophia's very uncomfortable. You can see she's visibly uncomfortable, which is kind of weird since the audience doesn't know that that part of this movie. Anyway, he, uh, he goes outside, they have some words. Sophia gets really uncomfortable. Brian steps in, then Sophia runs away, runs home, which is kind of a weird transition. Brian uh, has to go to his motorbike, I guess. It's up a street and around the corner or whatever. Anyway, uh, long story short, David passes out in the gutter and wakes up the next morning with his Phantom of the Opera mask. He goes home, takes a bunch of pills and kills himself. Then he's dead. But if you're rich, you really don't die. You just get cryogenically frozen. <laughs> While he's dead, quote unquote, he's having like this whole relationship with Sophia that he ne that, that never happened. He only met her like twice. One of those times he was completely out of his mind. Oh, by the way, David's afraid of uh, heights, which makes no sense that he lives in a penthouse in New York City. Just saying. So we get about like an hour and a half into this film and finally something happens. <laughs> you have the whole back and forth between Kurt Russell and the back and forth scenes and like, you're not really sure which part of the timeline you're in. So I established that timeline that he, at this point he's dead. So like Kurt Russell's uh, figuring in his imagination, at this point his subconscious is just at war with itself. First act ends. The first act ends 45 minutes into a fucking two hour long movie. That is way too long to get through your first fucking act. I don't care. <sighs> so there's uh, Benny the dog, who's like this weird motif that's strung throughout where it like leads you, it leads the subconscious. The subconscious is playing like little things here and there uh, within his altered dream states. Anyway, so Benny's there. Uh, the, his owner is like this weird fucking like, by the way, Spielberg's at David's birthday party. What the fuck? Where was I? Oh yeah, he's dead. So basically, I, that's the story is he's dead for like, he was like cryogenically frozen in his altered dream state where his subconscious is attacking him the whole time. This whole movie is a convoluted mess where everything's jumbled together. So we're an hour and a half into this film and that's where David within his like whole simulation 
ends up killing Sophia because he thinks Sophia is Julie and how can Sophia be Julie if Julie's been dead this whole time? He thinks it's the board. He basically, he's a paranoid person who seems to think like everybody's trying to take his money and his power from him. And I, I think his own problems came from himself. His whole undoing of his whole dream state was because he was too big of a to like own up to the he had done and to be a better person. Not only is there no likable, there's, Z, there's Penelope Cruz's character is the only likable character in this whole film. And it's two, it's two hours long. How the fuck am I gonna care about Tom Cruise? Anyway, there's these weird bar scenes that are intertwined in between of like the ending parts. So you don't know why he's in prison the whole time through the ha first half of the movie. Then you get to the part where he kills Sophia slash Julie in like an hour and a half in. And then the rest of the movie is just like, I don't care anymore, get to something that matters to me. He, he ends up at, at LE because apparently Michael Shannon and Kurt Russell busted him out of the jail, which was met with like minimum resistance, which lets you know that it's not real. And, and they, they mention how he's afraid of heights a lot in this film for like, f for the ending. It's just for the ending. It's the ending where he's on top of the roof and he's talking to Ellie and yeah, and Kurt Russell's like, I w I'm your subconscious. I want to survive. You should, I'm, I'm real. I've got kids. And tech support's like, what are their names? And he's like, oh, sh <laughs> and then Tom Cruise just jump yeets himself off the f***ing building. And that, that, that's the movie, really. Hey, Brandon, listen, man, thank you so much. So we got 10 more episodes to do. Killer f***ing elevator pitch for this film, man. Listen, keep being who you are. Uh, go back on the road. He's our traveling. He's going, hey, listen, he's going where you don't want to go deep into these films. So, hey, guy, hey, Brandon, thanks, man. No problem. I'll see y'all next week. All right, before we move on from Elevator Pitch, I wanted to bring up something real quick that I saw on IMDb. Cameron Crowe actually summed up the movie in the production notes with the following words. Snowboarding through life, David Ames appears to lead a charmed life, handsome, wealthy, and charismatic. The young New York City publishing executive's freewheeling existence is enchanting, yet he seems to be missing something. Like the pointillism? Like the pointillism of an impressionist landscape, a life can appear to be entirely different when examined close up. In one night, David meets a girl of his dreams and loses her by making a small mistake. Thrust unexpectedly onto a roller coaster ride of romance, comedy, suspicion, love, sex, and dreams, David finds himself on a mind bending search for his soul and discovers the precious, ephemeral nature of true love. Say that one time fast. I can't. I can't. I barely tried. made it through it and you were reading it. Do you agree with that as someone who has recently revisited the movie? Would you agree with that uh, with, with the writer director's summary I'm, of the film? I, I'm not going to disagree with his opinion. That's Everyone has one. Okay, then we're all in agreement that it is a great synopsis for a great film. Let's move well, on so what, to what do you know? No, 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 you can't. No, you, we all agree it's a great synopsis I'm just for, excited the film, to get, for the film. I'm just it's a great very, synopsis for the film. You, okay. I'm not going to let you cheat the, the viewing audience. No. Okay, I'm just excited to get into a new segment. We have quite a few new segments this week. We're trying to, this season, we're trying to tighten things up a little bit. So... The first new segment we have, we do our research. All this is is a is a quick rundown of the film that we are going to be covering, uh, the logistics of it, the trying to put you in the time and place of when this movie was released. So Vanilla Sky was released on December 10th, 2001. In a the glorious US. year, I may add. This year I walked across the stage and told the world I was here. <laughs> Okay, you yeah, you remember it for that. I feel like most people remember 2001 for a different reason. Was it whole 9-11 thing? Yeah, I that, about, that I heard, whole thing. I heard about that. That was crazy. Other films that came out around this time uh, that you may have seen in the theater if you were going to see Vanilla Sky was not another teen movie. Uh, JCVD's old Jean-Claude Van Damme's The Order. I don't think that would have, that was probably straight to DVD. Yes. Ali would join Vanilla Sky on the big screens on December 11th. Pokemon Mewtwo Returns and The Land Before Time 8, those were out and big at the time, and Peter Jackson's Lord of the Ring Fellowship of the Ring was just premiering in London. If you had to watch one of those movies again, which one would it be? Would it be? Land Before Time 8. All right. Okay. <laughs> On this day, December 10th, 2001, this was a Monday. The wounds from 9-11 were still fresh for America and much of the world. George W. Bush was president, and we thought he was bad and ridiculous. And dumb. I mean, cards on the table, you would take him back in a heartbeat right now. It. Him and his brother. <laughs> Most people were probably listening to Usher's You Got It, You Got It Bad. You're alone, 
right back. So let's talk about what they what they had to work with and what came in return to make this fantastic film. With a budget of 68 million, Vanilla Sky opened number one in the box office, bringing in over 25 million in its first weekend, with a total box office gross of over 200 million. I mean, it's hard to not open number one if you're just, just open on a weekend with nothing else. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I heard the movies that you just told me were coming. Go ahead, no, go ahead, kid. It feels like a 30 minute film to me, but the film actually runs at two hours and 16 minutes, or two hours and 21 minutes if you're watching it with the alternate ending. It was filmed in New York and California from November 6th of the year 2000 to March 19th of 2001. This is another news segment. Let's move on to connections. Or as I like to call it, the plug. This segment here where we talk about, or not we, what I'll be talking about with you guys this season is how we, so many of these movies, actors, and life, seven degrees of separation, there's a lot of connection in these films that we miss sometimes. And sometimes it, it takes a student or a fan of film to say, hey, you know what? That ties into this, that ties into that. So we're just gonna go ahead and get into it. So Spike Lee, um, if you notice, again, the, the film starts off with her saying, wake up, David, or open your eyes, David. Um, um, Spike Lee joint school days at the end, Lawrence Fishburne character says, wake up, wake up. It's screaming for people to wake up, open your eyes, really what the f is going on in the world. So there are always a lot of subliminal messages to what's truly what's going on. Another one of those things that I immediately found so hilariously funny, uh, I got Jason Lee who famously plays, and I'll discuss this later, who famously plays in My Name is Earl. Mm -hmm. uh, notice in My Name is Earl, he goes off, he's, he's trying to he's trying to correct all the mistakes he's made in life. But, but in, Shout out to Brad Copeland. Oh yeah, definitely. Shout out BC, as I call you. So as he's, you have the the, the character, the title character for Jason Lee from My, my, uh, my Name is Earl in the car giving Tom Cruise advice on life. I'm like, this is the irony of all ironies, dude. You up in life yeah. and now you're giving tom cruise advice is up so that was a, a huge huge connection for me also one of the things that really uh yeah definitely oh my gosh jesus christ uh this film had to had to be have been so bad uh that one of the connections i saw and it was that um, you, you, you told me when we were uh, researching the film that there were six, uh, there were mainly, mainly six theories mm -hmm. out there about the film, but I know about one Big Bang Theory because Galecki from Roseanne, uh, he's yeah, in there. Yeah. So so that to me, that was always, and you know what's so sad about that? That poor guy hadn't read a script since Vanilla Sky. He had to wait, he turned him into a f***ing nerd. Mm -hmm. He went um, from like Roseanne, Vanilla Sky, and then finally Big Bang Theory. Right, and you know why? Because he, he said he couldn't stand to look at another script after Vanilla Sky. I, I understand. I completely understood it. Completely understood it. Oh, oh, this connection is very fucking good, dude. Uh, freaking um, uh, there's a connection between um. Uh, uh, Tilda Swinton. I'm saying I, I apologize. I love her as an actress. Tilda Swinton. Swin T Tilda Swinton. She is also the, she is in this film doing this however in a film we'll preview later this season dr strange she's also given life advice as well as some type of she she speaks about extending your life in different ways and seeing life differently so i love that furthermore another connection i mean i was all into connections you should have saw me on this one sir but by, uh, by the way tilda school tilda swinton just kind of weirds me out naturally so i don't know what it is about her i don't feel like she's a female uh, I'm not saying she's a male. She just seems, she seems alien. And if anyone needs David's email address is DurdentGodfrey at gmail.com. All of my female support groups, I hear you sisters. I'm just speaking just... my truth. Stand down. Stand by. <laughs> you joke. <laughs> oh, such a proud guy. <laughs> All right, so with that being said, another one of the connections I really saw, I felt like that of the Truman Show because again, again, his life somewhat was being controlled by him so his connection of a control of the like making his life seem safe and what he wanted to be but really one of the connections i really love oh shout out to disney if you want to give me a job i promise i won't curse as much on disney plus don't make no fuss um the seven snow white and the seven doors snow white mm -hmm. was sleeping beauty so i like the, all, all those oh, yeah. i never boom on I, I, well, that's beauty. why you got me doing connections yeah, he, yeah that's why you got me doing connections i don't think i've seen that online anywhere either in all the in all the research that you, we've done you wouldn't because royal's not online that's what yeah. that's a really good that's a good one. You should have just the f you, you think I've been doing what about last season? I didn't have any good ones last season? We didn't do this segment then. Oh, you're right. Well, but okay. yeah, you did have some good connections. That's why. But, but that's that's probably one of the best ones. Yeah, because that's uh that checks out on all levels. And he then is... the shout out to uh, this. I have to get Paul Mooney into this show somehow. So this was definitely 
it was a modern day Othello. <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> the Othello of him, like, like, like loving someone and not sure what life is like, what's going on. And so you kill the person you love and so you think. So mm -hmm. those were all the connections. Of course, the uh, total recall connection of everything. Yeah. So yeah, so guys, listen, hey, I'm gonna be plugging you in all year. Get used to it. <laughs> all right, I like that. All right, let's move on to Hear Me Out. This is another new segment. This is where we reach well, some, well, sometimes we're gonna we're gonna really reach. Sometimes it's just gonna be very blatant. Mine's a little bit blatant this time, uh, where we uh, propose a theory um, for the film about the film or something in regards to the film. Hmm. I just want you to know I don't have a theory. I have actually what the fuck happened. Okay. Well, so do I. You you go first, then. <clears throat> okay. So I, I I like to take the straightforward path. I like, I am inclined to believe everything that tech support is saying in the end in the elevator. I think he died by an overdose by, by his own hands um, because he was so heartbroken over Sophia. Mm -hmm. I think the splice happened when he wakes up after the night in the club. Mm -hmm. His lucid dream picks up when he wakes up outside Sophia's house after the club. So everything, the, the murder, the the switch between Sophia and Julia, uh, or Julie, um, Juliana. Uh, I think all of that was a part of the lucid dream. The Kurt, Kurt Russell, McCabe, I think it, he was a part of the lucid dream. Like all of that was, was the manifestation of uh, David Ames' subconscious. Gotcha. And it's pretty obvious. Like uh, it, was, it was always a mystery to me when I first watched the movie, but going back and watching it last night, it was just so obvious that when he wakes up outside of her apartment, things are just, there's this realism to everything that's happening before that. It starts with the sky. You see it when they, the, the sky, the paint. But, yeah. but the biggest thing to me was the relationships. Like the night before was more how things would play out in reality. This is somebody that she only briefly knew, then he disappears, and mm -hmm. then he comes back disfigured and tries to pick up their relationship where it left off in his mm -hmm. mind. Mm -hmm. Like, they're already this thing. And to her, he's still pretty much a stranger. She, you know, she brings the, um, Brian along for the, uh, the night at the club because mm -hmm. she doesn't feel whatever. She feels awkward around him at best. Right. So like all that was like painfully real and then he wakes up the next day and it is she's in love with him come into my apartment right he gets his face repaired everything the relationship with Brian is repaired right. like everything works out in his favor so i think it all plays out exactly the way tech support says and then at the end he's faced with that decision do you continue the lucid dream now it's been corrected or mm -hmm. do you leap off the building and rejoin the real world 150 years in the future in the year 21 how many times has he done that jump remember he runs towards the end he was like oh i'm almost fine. I'm like is this yeah. mission impossible edge after tomorrow whatever so, so it's he he literally says i want to go back to real life mm -hmm. uh, i want to live my real life mm -hmm. so that's all it's all pretty straightforward mm -hmm. tech support says exactly what happens he chooses the real life but where it gets murky for me is yes, when he wakes up at the end, before his eyes open, mm -hmm. you hear Sophia's voice again, just mm -hmm. like in the very beginning of the movie where sh she says, uh, open your eyes. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that, that kind of throws things off for me because... Oh, that's when it threw, th the end is when it threw things off. For yeah, me. because cool. he could either be waking up... That's cute. He could either be waking up in, uh, that, like, what is real life? Because they they keep saying like life. Well, according as you, to Morpheus, why? Do you think you can touch and feel? Do you think that's real? Well, like tech support always says, you know, when you were alive in the traditional sense. Mm -hmm. So when he says, "I want to go back to my real life," mm -hmm. consider the fact he only lived as a human being, like outside of this cryogenic state for thirty three years. Yeah. He's been in that cryogenic state, mm -hmm. lucid dreaming for a hundred and fifty like years. So it, at, at that point. What is your real life? Nothing. All the people you've known, everything, and even the guy tells him. Like, he was rich as f before he went in, but I guess cost of living over 150 years, he told him, like, your finances won't last long. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, he, because he Lucy, because the, they've been draining him of his money for 150 f years. And he gave him the logistics of what reality would be like 150 years in the future, but right. what David Ames says is he wants to live his real life. Right. 
And I just feel like because you hear Sophia's voice before he opens his eyes, it's almost like he's waking back up to the lucid dream and tech support perceived that to be what he meant by saying real life. No, I th well, I just, uh, this is just still your theory, but uh, I know what I took from it, if, if based off what you're saying is if he went back to his real life, remember his real life, he didn't get fixed. He was still having those headaches. His mind was still fucked up. So he would still probably be remembering some of those things. That That's what I have in my notes. That was my alternative huh. was if, if he is not lucid dreaming. And that's the great thing about this movie is that you can watch it and Slow down, both Tiger. answers can be correct. He can either still be lucid dreaming and waking up to Sophia, or it's a uh, it's it's conveying the fact that when he wakes up, he's still going to be haunted by Sophia. That's so mentally, like, he hears her voice even though she's not there, and that's probably what he's going to hear until to me, he dies. It, it, it's not the second one; it has to be the first one. Because think about it: she, the Sophia presence was so strong that even while he was, she invaded his lucid dream. This did such a number on him that she invaded his lucid dream mm -hmm. and those women groups who it, just unisex it goes each way y'all keep writing him not me so here's the thing okay the right listen you're never going to be on daytime tv with your theories you got to give him some spice you got to give him some pizzazz and kids everybody i want everybody in on me real quick okay i don't even have to look in the book for this because i know how i can feel let me tell you something this comes down to first off one word greed and 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 if I can't say anything else, keep your, what is it? Keep your friends close, but your enemies close. Let me tell you something. I know what the fuck happened in this film. You're talking about the end, the end. That's not what it does it for me. I'm talking about right before he goes into that lucid dream. Let me tell you something. I, I did, in the rewatch, I did catch something I didn't catch the first time. And I'm going to tell you this right now. <laughs> that mother fucker, Jason Lee, is the cause of this whole and he wouldn't even movie. own up to it. No, right, right. And see, and see, it's that. It was that one little moment where he would like. He asked them something. He like, hey, did you say something to Sophia last night? He like, why would I do that? And he kind of looks like the one off. And it all comes down to Tom Cruise's greed. And he and he told and, and uh, David Ames greed. And, and and he told him that. And Jason Lee told him that. He said, look, man. He like, we almost just died, and your life flashed before my eyes. Mm -hmm. So he's already letting them know, man. I want to be you. You're paying for my book deal. We're best friends. Like, damn, dude. And then right at the night of that party, when he, because clearly he had a little. Jason had a little bit of a drinking problem so he's fucked up and he's he's like oh my god because think about it he had just brought so he had just brought uh Julian uh Sophia to the party mm -hmm. and he said hey man listen man I normally don't do this but man to man bro to bro I really like this girl stop flirting like I just like no I would do like this is not like a regular you know like I like her like her mm -hmm. now he already has said that Giuliani which is a play on Giuliani by the way from New York I meant to tell you that but he's saying to her he looks at her and says he he, he sees what's happening with, with Giuliani Sophie. the worst thing that ever happened, happened in New, New York. York well the worst thing that ever happened to him was that fucking paint running down the side of his <laughs> face ass clown so with that being said he is at a point to where he had already said, he said, man, so my dream girl is your buddy. He told him that in the car, and then he said, and then they almost died, your life flashed before my eyes. So he always wanted his life, and so the one thing he could have was this pure thing with Sophia, something that David Ames had not poisoned or touched. And the moment he brings this girl to his party, he's all on him. So in his mind, he's like, dude, what the f***? They're best friends. He's not finna like blow it off. But what he did do, he went it. Now he had no idea that that Julie Gi Giuliani was gonna f and do all that. Sh but he told her that, sh and he felt horribly bad. You know why? Because that's who I, me and you are f friends. If you die, I'm not throwing you no f three day memorial. You're gonna get a long 24 hours. You're not throwing you no f three day memorial. That's I mean, guilt. You remember how drunk Brian was that night, though. He I, probably truly believed that he didn't say anything. No, no, no. He looked down, dude. When he, he looked down he know he said it and I, he said it on even if he wasn't drunk he was love and lust drunk dude like that's fucked up you see this playboy guy who's your best friend he has all the money all the girls everything he wants he has a board of older men bowing and towel tipping to him and all you want is this girl you tell him like dude i know you got everything in the world but this this one little thing right here mm -hmm. i love it and i think i can see myself with it and then you still go and get it so to me, and here's the It'd part be about crazy it. Crazy if he wasn't resentful. I'd be more weirded out if he wasn't resentful. No, dude, it was it was like, him. He okay. really he he is the reason all because had he not said that there wouldn't be a movie. So I'm telling you that that he uh, Jason Lee's character was the cause of every thing that happened. No, let me rephrase that. 
the greed. It all goes back to greed because at, even after he did all that and he met Sophia, and I believe now they, they did a great job of showing them in love. That because I really feel like they had a good love connection going. But I'm gonna tell you something. Yeah. Had he just did you picked a hell of a time to be in the studio honest. Hey, he just kept his word and did what he said he was going to do and went to work mm -hmm. and not got in the car with Cameron Diaz's, Diaz's character. Mm -hmm. None of that shit would happen. Because remember, Sophia said, I thought you were going to work. I thought yeah. you were going straight to work. And then he got in the car with her. He says that at the end. He told her at the end, well, I, I, I lost you and I got in that car. Right, and he did. So, yeah, that's my, that's my, that's not even a theory. The fact is, Benny, it's all David Ames' fault. But but Benny is the catalyst. Brian. I mean, uh, Brian, Brian is the catalyst. Yeah. Brian is the catalyst. And shout out to Benny the dog. Something's wrong with that fucking dog too. Oh yeah, another connection. Get out. What's that? You can't tell me all this. that dog looked like he had been his, his, the transfer of the subconscious. Remember? Oh, okay. Yeah. No, yeah. the life extension. They're, they're like, like they're moving your mind and playing with your mind, which lets me know, just like any other film, when we found out about cell phones, they had been out a hundred years. It's, it's people in other people's bodies, man. Oh uh, yeah. Oh uh, yeah. I could agree. Uh, before we move on, I'll, I have I'm gonna I'm gonna share the six approved uh, theories for the film approved it, by Cameron Crowe. And even though I just gave him the real one, okay, go ahead. Yes, six supported theories. You can find them on Cameron Crowe's website, The Uncool. Uh, the site reads: Here are the six theories. Number one. The movie is just as it is explained. David commits suicide. He is frozen and the splice occurs, etc. The sound you hear is David awakening in the future. Number two, everything up to the car wreck was real and the rest of the entire film was all in David's head as he lay in a coma until the end when he wakes up. So there, that's a pretty interesting theory that he gets in the car wreck, he never wakes up from the coma and everything's just kind of weird from there. Um, number three, the entire film is a dream as David struggles with his vanity, his sexual past, his ideal women, uh, etc. The only real scene in the entire film would be the last as he wakes up. Number four, the movie is writer Brian Shelby's fictional story about his friend, David Ames, a story of the sour and the sweet. He plays the unsung hero to the playboy. Number five, the whole thing is a dream in that the depictions we see take place as reflections within a dream. However, the events are real until the splice, at which time they become fiction. Tech support states that David has been asleep 150 years. David's sessions seem to be reflections of his past. I think a fair interpretation is that the reflections have been tampered with by the subconscious to reflect his love for Sophia and the regret of his carelessness with Julie. You are relying on the unreliable narrator as to the details like his love sort of being all around him before he meets her, his fears, dates, and the music. Like retelling a story that you know ends badly, you may create clues to take the edge off or tip your subconscious that this is a reflection, a memory, not reality. And the last one, number six, are Christian metaphors, a story of divinity. David commits suicide, finally driven to it by the guilt over the death of Jolie Gianni. As he is dying, his life is passing before his eyes. While his life is passing before his eyes, he is also being tempted to sell his soul to the devil for the chance to make things right. David is asked many times, did you sign a contract? Then there's lucid dreams, kind of like Lucifer. Both women at LE have uh, red hair. Tilda Swinton has hot sauce behind her. More importantly, Tilda Swinton is exactly the kind of personality you, ex you would expect the devil to have at the time of one's death. Vaguely sexy, assuring, calming, and persuasive. The ideas of David's Christ-likeness are from the following ideas. He dies at 33, as did Christ. His father wrote the book, uh, and the book was called Defending the Kingdom, and the magazine is called Rise. Out of all that, was that your theory? No, these no, are no, 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 because I heard about the Tilda Swinton thing again. I'm just trying to figure out why don't you like her? What did she do to you? You said she's weird, now she's the devil. Now she, I mean, put some I did, words again, on her. I didn't say this. This is the, the uncool. No, I, you didn't. I don't believe she's the devil. No, what you're doing I is uncool. What alien. you're doing is stop bashing women, man. I'm not going to have that on this show. You got to find yourself another co host. I love and respect women. So those are the six approved theories. That's his theory and that's my theory. What was your theory? Let us know in the comments if uh, for any reason it's... Let us know in the comments <laughs> if it's like not one of those or if it is one of those. Let us know in the comments, whatever. The other theory is, is that one, 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 un, I didn't know if you saw it. It's not approved by Cameron Crowe. One other theory is that this was a spinoff of uh, Demolition Man. Of them freezing people and, and you know it's just it's the, yeah, but they, yeah. the program didn't work after, after that happened to David Ames they shut them down so they just started using it on prisoners and shit. 
Well, Demolition Man was what, like 1995? That's yes. when that. First, it was first. So they started, just like anything, they started testing the prisoners first, like they tested the Casiga Airmen. Yeah. I was going to bring that back in. Yeah. And now then they got it out there. Test on the prisoners, see if it works, and now it's out there. That's no theory. I like that one. I that, just came that, up with I, just, I literally I'm just, just came I'm up with trying, that. I'm, in real time, I'm trying to wrap my head around the timeline of how that would transpire from 1995 to 2001. To, uh, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that You can't that because right the movie was in 95, but it was based in the future. So it yeah. still technically wouldn't play yeah. that way. Yeah, just something, something uh, to wrap I'll, your head around. I'll definitely, I'll, I'll, I'll do some research on that. All right, because we do our research. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Casting Call. This is another news segment. Mr. Royal, would you like to explain to the audience? Yes. Listen, some of you in the soft porn community may be familiar with what we call role reversal. And so what we do sometimes, we watch films. I know as a child when I was always like, first off, when I used to see people on TV, I'm like, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. Everybody that came on other than Sidney Portier, Denzel, and Tom Hanks at the time, I was like, I can, I, they might as well have me because the rest of this stuff is just a shit show. But as you grow up and realize there's other talented people out there, you still realize there is a shit show out there but sometimes you say man I really love this movie but I would really love to see this person in that character or, or like we, we call it what we like to call it is the uh last action hero effect to where they had Sylvester Stallone playing Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Terminator so what we brought to you guys this season was we rewatched the films and we said what would this film have been like if we added these characters in there and so since I'm introducing the segment I'll go ahead and start off because I got a badass combination that if I gave you a million years there is no f***ing way you would have got this combination no f***ing way. Wait, let me guess. Well, who are the two people that you're replacing? I have three. Okay, I'll tell you three, three people. Okay, I'll tell you three people I'm replacing right now. I am replacing uh, 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 David Ames' character. I am replacing uh, Sophia's character. And I'm replacing Julie's character. Okay, so first off, David Ames, of course, is replaced by Forrest Whitaker. No, but I like it. <laughs> Could you imagine? Oh, why the f*** did you keep f***ing with He's going to fuck you up, all right? I'm telling it's you. It's a nightmare. Actually, you wouldn't be able to tell when he came back with a deformed face. There would be no distinction between... <laughs> I, Zuri, son of Gaku, leave him the f*** alone. Uh, Jesus I don't, Christ. I don't got anybody else. I just want to... Forrest Whitaker plays also Jolie and so he... Uh, all right, all right. <laughs> David Ames will be... Because, again, remember now, you just can't just say a person because... I mean, not talking to you, but you can't just say a person, guys, just because it's your favorite actor. You, they have to still be able to pull off the same emotional t tug and things of that nature, so... I, I would argue to make this segment even more interesting, it doesn't just have to be that, but it could be something like, imagine how terrible it would be if that... Like, oh, I like it that. go in any direction. You can go in I like that. Wherever we want to go. I like I went in a positive the direction for this one because so did I okay great so four oh, you know what let's go character by character then I only got one okay great all right so I'll go and then you go for all right so for David Ames Hugh Jackman yeah, I didn't ask I, if you, I, I, it's I my choice because yeah, you're looking I'm, I'm just I wasn't approving or denying you I just didn't just think that was coming considering though. I'm thinking yeah but the, the, not not Wolverine Hugh Jackman I'm talking about like the prestige like and, Les Mis Hugh Jackman like, yeah, yeah Hugh Jackman yeah man he's yeah, the prestige, mainly the prestige Hugh Jackman but you know he's I, did, I feel like he might be too humble that would be my only if I was sitting in the casting room with you I'd be like his, his I'm not really believing no, his ego no because then he couldn't play Wolverine Wolverine, yeah, okay. I don't know enough about Wolverine to argue that. I'll so. take it from there. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. Um, all right, so I think the casting was perfect. I do have something I wanted to Jesus replace. Jesus Christ, but no surprise. He thinks everything about the movie is perfect. Go ahead. Tom Cruise, I mean, the casting, you have to give it to Oh, them. yeah, oh, yeah. I'll, I'll give him that. Yes, yes. They, they have gotten so much character development out of the way that they didn't even have to be in the movie purely by making Tom Cruise David Ames. Oh, yes. Because we already identify him as, like, the perfect personification of someone who's driven by their ego mm -hmm. and this isn't saying that Tom Cruise are these things but someone that's a star on his level that we've known since childhood mm -hmm. that's like lived in the spotlight his whole life right it's just easy to put those characteristics Except on him where he's vain yeah. he's all on the surface and he's very self-assured he's very can confident. I guess yours is it are you, who, who'd you replace I mean who, who, I, who, I replaced kid? David Ames did you go Christian Bale no that would have been Good though. I mean, there's literally. I, I think that needs to be one part of this segment. Is could Christian Bale have done this? The answer will always be yes. yes. And he would have looked the part. Would we have wanted Christian Bale? To no, because he really would have killed that shit. <laughs> yeah, I I would say Denzel Washington. And my reason is he was at his peak popularity in 2001. This is fresh off a of training day. Mm -hmm. My nigga. <laughs> So, and he's got that same kind of larger-than-life ego. 
Yo, he he literally just yelled in the middle of the streets, I'm King Kong. Or, no, actually, he's better than King Kong. King, King Kong, Kong got ain't got, got on him. him. Yeah, so that's... that. That's, shot that's, me in the ass, see? I think that's an ego that could match Tom Cruise's, okay. and he was also, like Tom Cruise, he has that good emotional range where he can go from, like, he's entertaining to watch get hysterical. The, the, the more emotional he gets, the more entertaining it is. Well, by saying that, then you might as well say uh, uh, John David Washington could have done it too, because he really showed, when we did this to intend it, he really was giving. Have, have you fucked have you my wife? Not yet. Yeah. And he proceeds to go beat some bad, he'd be a badass and walk out of a kitchen. But yes, sir. So the other two connections I had, I'm sorry, the, the ones I would have replaced would have been, okay, um, for Penelope Cruz character, uh, Julie, I would have done, uh, done Scarlett Johansson. Okay. I see you. I'm. Let, I'm. 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 Love doing this real time because you're processing as I'm saying and trying to put them into the character. And I hear. Here. Here you go. This is going to go. Uh, Julie. Uh, Julie Giuliani. Uh, Gina Davis. Wow. Uh, Long kiss. Good night, Gina Davis. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I could see it. I, I she, can't. But Cameron Diaz just knocked it out of the park. She, oh. Oh. No. We'll, we'll get there later. Yeah. Yes. She definitely. She definitely did. Because that, that, that's talking about our scenes. But yeah. Those. The, so, I got. I got. A few. These, these are some real life casting calls that almost happened okay. during the, the casting of the movie. So Kate Hudson turned down the role of Julie Giuliani. Maggie Gyllenhaal was turned down for the role. Uh, Jared Leto auditioned for the role of Brian Shelby. That ultimately ultimately went to Jason Lee. Mm. Kurt Russell accepted his role without even reading the script. And Michael Keaton, Harrison Ford, and Alec Baldwin were all considered for the role. Couldn't have seen Harrison Ford do it, but I can definitely see that. I can see Michael Keaton and uh, just, uh, just either Michael Keaton or, or Kurt Russell. Don't give me anybody else. And I just love seeing Kurt Russell in those surprise roles that we don't see. And I, I, I know we'll talk about it later, but he definitely knocked his part uh, the part too. He wasn't yeah. given much to work with, but even at the end when he does some other and what are your daughter's names? I'm real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah. All right, let's move on to... Pop Quiz Hot Shot. Formerly known as Big Fikes. <laughs> it has been changed to Pop Quiz Hot Shot for all of our speed fans. The movie, not, not the, the drug. drug. Well, the drug too. Whatever. No, not whatever. Kids, <laughs> don't do drugs unless it's marijuana. Here are the top ten facts about Vanilla Sky. Number ten. Did it start? There are no opening credits for the film. Wow, I missed that. Number nine, when the hell? The film takes place in the year 2151. The label on the canister identified David Ames' first life cycle from 9-22-68 to 12-26-2001. It should be noted that the film was released one week and five days before the date of David's death. Director Cameron Crowe referred to Vanilla Sky as a glimpse into the future one week away. There's actually that moment where David Ames looks directly into the camera when tech support looks at the camera, like at the audience and says, your panel is awaiting your decision. Mm -hmm. It's like, we are living with him. Yeah. yeah. That's, it's kind of, yeah, bringing the curtain back. I like that. Number eight, Mama Crow. At the end of the movie in the hallway of LE, Cameron Crow's mom, uh, Alice Crow, is the first face seen on the television monitors promoting LE services. I know what it's like to have your mom come to a show, a movie, film, or be in one. Number seven, pop culture hot shot. Cameron Crow said there are 428 references to pop culture made in the film. 429 if you include one, made in error. We aren't going to name all 429, but here's a few. To Kill a Mockingbird plays in the holding block on the television screen in the security room in almost all the scenes between David and Dr. McCabe. It's one of Cameron Crowe's favorite movies and it's later revealed that David based his ideal father figure on Gregory Peck's Atticus Finch. The album, The Free Willing, Bob Dylan, can be seen in David's bedroom. Later, he and Sophia recreate the image as pointed out during the end montage. There are multiple occasions when the number or time 909 is displayed prominently. David's watch, the chalkboard, a kid wearing a blue shirt that says number nine, and of course, all the mentions of cats. Crow has stated in multiple interviews that this is an homage to the Beatles and their song Revolution Number Nine. All right, number six, goofs. No movie is perfect, except for The Living Wake. Even a movie with as much attention to detail as Vanilla Sky, it is bound to have a few goofs, and here are a few. During the Times Square scene, while David is running next to a building with glass walls, looking very carefully in the background, you could make out a line of people at the window. 
watching the filming of the movie. Crow caught this and considered digitally removing them, but ultimately decided it fit with the theme of subtle paranoia, so he left them in. AKA, they weren't going back, it was film was locked, they weren't going back to do that shit. The eye line off in the final scene, when David runs up to jump off the roof, he jumps up on the ledge and then stops and turns around to look at Sophia. She is looking up at him, so he should be looking down since he's higher on the ledge, but he's also looking up. Kids in film school, that's where over the shoulder, shot continuity, crossing the line, oh, you know, you know those phrases. Which, I... that might not be a goof, because she's not even really technically there, and right. it might just be a metaphor that he's always looking up to her. Like, like she's unachievable. Yeah, but they still got to keep some mistake. continuity, though. It wasn't a mistake. It's on purpose. When David and Brian are almost hit by the Mack truck, we can clearly see the camera and camera operator wearing a hat in David's side window. Come on, guys. Keep it classy. When David awakes after sleeping in the street, the camera and equipment are reflected in the street puddles. Yet again, can't cheat father crime time. Number five, Crow's Clues. Crow has been quoted as saying, we constructed the movie visually and story-wise to reveal more and more the closer you look at it. As deep as you want to go with it, my desire was for the movie to meet you there. There are definitely plenty of clues that could lend to various theories throughout the film. Here are just a few. At the start of the movie, when David wakes up with Jolie Gianni, her cell phone rings playing row, row, row your boat. When she answers the phone, it stops the music just before the lyric, life is but a dream. In the cell, Carl Jung's book, Memories, Dreams and Reflections, can be seen on the table. The book is all about Jung's personal dreams and how they helped uncover his shadow and remove his persona or mask. At the club, Sophia wears a t-shirt that says St. Rose. Along with being the, pat the patron saint of Latin and South America, St. Rose is the patron saint against vanity. St. Rose used to pray, Lord, increase my sufferings and with them increase your love in my heart. And speaking of patron, uh, check out our link for Patreon and become a patron of the show. I've never heard you read a verse in my entire life life god man that was that was surreal Jesus anyway yes yeah. <laughs> when david is arrested the plaque on his photo lineup reads actually i'm just going to put it on the screen right here some elementary code breaking reveals when did the dream become a nightmare there are two other coded messages uh, mentioned on cameron crow's commentary on the 3D x-ray of David Ames' skull. To the lower left of the skull, it reads 4-O-N-0-T-W-1-K-5-8-9-M-U-P or do not wake him up. To the lower right, there is a message P-L-5-1-S-1-N-T-4-R-5-1-M-S or pleasant dreams. The Pleasant Dreams message is also printed on the life extension body tag after David swallows all the pills that end his life. And if you didn't see, David has it written out on his shirt. He just showed you guys that he took him hours to do this, so there you go. <laughs> yet again, all right. All right, multiple times throughout the film, during glitches, David patient account number 30319 can be heard. And yet again, there's a three, which is the bit, you guys get it, three times three is nine, all the nines, there you go. And it's that, uh, it, I, I definitely heard it when you put the pillow over her, over Sophia Julie's face. Right. It, it's, it's like repeating it over and, and over again. the sad part again. about it, I think she was enjoying that fixation. Yeah. When David is awoken on the street by Sophia, where he chooses his place to be, as Sophia crouches to talk to him, a vibrantly colored sky is featured in the background resembling the Monet painting Vanilla Sky. Another clue that this is where a lucid dream begins. Further, one can hear the sound effect of a tape rewinding and, as mentioned before, an audible splice. Mm -hmm. In the scenes with McCabe interviewing David in the prison cell, the word dream can be seen written backwards on the blackboard in the background. The sticker on David's car reads 23001, a date that clearly could not exist in our version of reality. Just a, a, a hint that this is some alternate reality altogether, that none of it takes place in the reality as yeah. we know it. I guess we we'll go to Fantasyland for us to give us two more days of Black History Month, huh? <laughs> Nobody wants that. All right. <clears throat> All right. Right before David collapses on the street after, after being in the nightclub, R.E.M.'s Sweetness Follows plays. This is a moment right before the splice where his lucid dream begins. R.E.M. is the portion of sleep cycle where dreams take place. See? See what I'm saying, man? The attention to detail in this movie oh, yeah, is that's so good. So good. So good. At the party, when Brian Shelby comes into the second apartment where David and Sophia are talking, you can see his t-shirt with the words fantasy in sparkly sequins. This supports the idea that the whole movie, until the last scene where David wakes up, is all but a dream. 
Shelby my ass, Brian scheming Shelby out of here anyway. When imprisoned, David wears a patient ID with his last name and initial. Underneath appears the letters 6ROZ5N and 7UY. This translates into the code Frozen Guy. Number four, stage name. The song I Fall Apart from that Cameron Diaz's character plays for David in the car scene is actually performed by Cameron Diaz. In the credits, Juliana Gianni is given the glory for performing the song. The song's lyrics and music were written by Cameron Crowe and his wife, famed composer and heart lead vocalist Nancy Wilson. Nancy Wilson's photo actually appears during the pop culture montage at the end of the film. And bonus fact, Cameron Diaz was referred to as CD during production to avoid confusing her with, with uh, Cameron Crowe. The Dakota. David Aim lives in the Dakota the famed New York City apartment building where John Lennon lived and unfortunately died. While the interior shots were filmed on a set, the briefly seen exterior was shot on location without a permit since the residents do not allow filming on the premises. Kids in the industry, that's what we call guerrilla filming. And number two, approved. Vanilla Sky is the English adaptation of Alejandro Amenabar's 1997 film, I'm sorry if I raped that name, uh, Open Your Eyes. I'm gonna rape it again. Here we go. Amanda, 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 Amanda Bar, Amanda Bar. Amanda Bar said that when he learned that Cameron Crowe was going to write and direct the movie based on his film starring Tom Cruise as the lead, he felt honored. And after seeing Vanilla Sky, he said he couldn't be more proud. Quote, Vanilla Sky is as true to the original spirit as it is irreverent towards its form. And that makes it a courageous, innovative work. Crow has said the original film is like a song our band really liked and we decided to cover it our own way. I view my adaptation as a remix rather than a remake. The film is a genre-bending, mind-twisting portrait of the American male as he exists in five minutes into the future. Hopefully it honors the original. I like the idea it could be sort of a dialogue between the two movies. I kept thinking of the original like a folk song. There's so many different ways you can play it and you can reinvent it your own way. I would never say to somebody, don't see his CRs. I want people to see both. In the very beginning of the Mellow Sky, a voice is heard whispering a Spanish phrase that translates to open your eyes. Bonus fact, Tom Cruise also approves of the film, calling it the best film he has done. When did they, when did they ask him that? Um, I think it was like a couple days ago. Uh, number one, Fresh Wounds. Studio execs wanted Cameron Crowe to use special effects to remove shots of the World Trade Center from Vanilla Sky after the 9-11 attacks. As you can see, Crowe chose not to remove them and they appear in several shots of New York City. What do you think about that decision? I think it was fine because of the fact that it's a film and it, it, it's whatever, man. People try to take creative liberties with everything. All right, and for our special segment of uh, Pop Quiz Hot Shot, we have the top 10 Tom Cruise films. Uh, this is not a biased opinion. This is according to Rotten Tomatoes, which is a uh, culmination of all critics and audiences' um, reception to the film. Number 10, Collateral, came out in 2004. Tom Cruise and Jamie Foxx scored a 86. Of course, driven by director Michael Mann's trademark visuals and a lean, villainous performance from Tom Cruise, C Collateral is stylish and compelling noir thriller. Number nine, American Made. This was 2017, got an 85%. American Made's fast and loose attitude with its real life story mirrors the cavalier and delightfully watchable energy Tom Cruise gives off in the leading role. To quote Sean Carter for the color of money like a Tom Cruise flick, uh, 1986, and it got an 89 rating on Rotten Tomatoes. This is an inf this is an inferior to the original. Goes without saying, however. But Paul Newman and Tom Cruise are a joy to watch, and of course Martin Scorsese direction is typically superb. Number seven, Rain Man, 1988. Burn. 89%. Uh, check out our episode from season one, the finale. Try to put the link up right there. If you don't show it coming up, it means YouTube wasn't playing nice. This road trip movie about an autistic savant and his callow brother is far from seamless, but Barry Levinson's direction is impressive. And strong performances from Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman add to its appeal. Number six, Minority Report. Came out in 2002, scored a 90 with Rotten Tomatoes, and that's pretty high. It's very thought-provoking and visceral. Steven Spielberg successfully combines high-concept ideas, high octane action, and it's a fast and fantastic sci-fi thriller. Number five, Edge of Tomorrow, 2014, 91%. 
Ripping, well-acted, funny, and clever, Edge of Tomorrow offers entertaining proof that Tom Cruise is still more than capable of shouldering the weight of a blockbuster action thriller. If you haven't subscribed to this show, that's what we like to call Risky Business. Came out in one of the best years ever, 1983, and it got a 92% with Rotten Tomatoes, featuring one of Tom Cruise's one of his really his best early performances to be honest with you risky business is a sharp funny examination of a teen's angst that doesn't stop short of exploring dark themes at all number three mission impossible rogue nation this was 2015 and got a 93 percent mission impossible rogue nation continues to franchise his thrilling resurgence and proves that tom cruise remains an action star without equal scorcher snide except this time it's cold <laughs> <laughs> All right, number two, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol came out in 2011 and scored a whopping 94% with Rotten Tomatoes. It's very stylish, fast paced, and you know, it's, it's loaded with gripping set pieces. Now, I will tell you, this is fourth, fourth installment. Listen, it's a, it, it's like blockbuster, big budget popcorn entertainment. It really works, man. It really does. Uh, before I say number one, I just wanted to give an honorable mention to Les, Gross, Les Grossman. Yeah. Uh, Tropic Thunder. Thunder. Oh, please, yes. Yeah, unfortunately, it would not. It 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 wasn't in the running for this list because he wasn't credited in that movie. Right. So it's technically not uh, Tom Cruise. Hey, who's the key grip? I want you to punch that director in the face really f***ing hard. Yes. All right, number one, the best Tom Cruise film according to Rotten Tomatoes is Mission Impossible Fallout 2018. This got a 97%, which is damn near perfect. Uh, fast, sleek, and fun, Mission Impossible Fallout lives up to the impossible part of its name by setting yet another high mark for insane set pieces in a franchise full of them. Well, there you go, guys. Those are the top 10 Tom Cruise films. All right, and that brings us to one of our most popular segments from last season, Seven Minutes in Heaven. David, remind them why we do this. Because every film has standout moments, whether it's good or a bad film. This is the time that we take a moment to appreciate those standout moments. And uh, we all know what Seven Minutes in Heaven is. It's, it's a beautiful thing that you experienced, most likely as a teenager. And... Uh, these are the scenes in films that make us feel like that. Yes, uh, I mentioned this one earlier, David, so I'm going to go right into it here. Uh, if you didn't, if it didn't make the cut, as we call it here, it was when, is when Brody's character, Jason Lee's character at the beginning here is in the car giving advice to Tom Cruise's character. To me, him riding around saying, we almost died, your light, and your life flashed before my eyes. He says, my dream girl is your f buddy. It is setting up so much so fast about really the integrity of and the type of person that that jason lee's character portrays that, that the irony that years later he he does a show my name is earl and and has a list of things he does that he has to make up for well you got a lot more to make up for pal but that beginning scene of them riding in the car together that's one of my top three scenes from the film okay that there's so many good scenes in this movie how is that that's like nothing to you okay uh my 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 number three is um is after he's spending the that amazing night with Sophia. He's professing that he's going to change. He walks out in the morning to be confronted by Julie. And that moment, you immediately know that there is something grave. Like, the, the way that that moment was portrayed between the acting, the cinematography, the editing, uh, there was something that felt so heavy about that moment where he's standing outside and, and Julie pulls up. And when she tells him gives him the choice to get in the car you know as the audience member that he's already made that he's made the wrong choice you know that before he does and then all the way to the point where she's you know playing the song and she's flipping out on him and end up driving off the bridge like that that whole moment felt so heavy like real life heavy like like this is a this is a very important decision that's being made these are the consequences and it all felt it was it was just delivered very very well and if you notice the place where Jolie picks him up from outside of uh, Sophia's apartment is the same place that Sophia picks him up from the night after the club mm. so right. that's where and it's weird that that's where he chose his splice to be when he begins lucid dreaming is well, in, it's not in, weird though because that's where it happened that's where it 
to yeah. sever. Yeah. Had he did what he said he was going to do, his life would have went completely different, but he didn't, and that, that's what happened. Uh, and uh, one more thing about that. I think what made that part so heavy was the casting. Like, the fact that Cameron Diaz is the person, because this is, uh, I don't even think up until this moment, Cameron Diaz has never played a role so tragic and in a movie so... Heavy. Yeah, and like dark. And for her to, for them to cast her as that person, that made... The, that whole moment and that made her death feel as jarring as it does in real life because it comes unexpectedly because of the casting choice. Yes, I, I, most people would disagree with me in this, but because, see, here's the thing about it. I know how to be uh, vibrant and, 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 and lively and, and, and portray myself a certain way, but to me, as a fan of film, I did Cameron Diaz more as a villainous character than the happy go Joe Lucky uh, go Lucky kind because to me, she'll never win an Oscar doing the happy Joe Lucky. I mean, because she's great at that. She reminds mm -hmm. me freaking Christy from the uh, freaking uh, Three's Company. She's just you know, so funky uh, Charlie's Angel. Yeah, I get it. You're, you're yeah. always gonna be great at that. But you got range, kids. You can do that too. So I, I, I agree with you on that. I like that. I definitely like that. Uh, my second scene was the man. Man, that that board meeting with those doctors the first time. Oh my God! When 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 Tom Cruise comes out, he was like, "Medicine, ooh!" If you know the history of Tom Cruise from Scientology and everything, and furthermore, yeah. they're also pe poking fun fun at Big Pharma. Basically, stating here's a guy that has all the money in the world at the time, 150 years before spending it on life extension, but has all the money in the world and they're sitting him telling sitting here telling him modern medicine is telling him what he doesn't believe in is that there is nothing you can do we can do something about your arm okay yeah. and, because and then he and he he probably yells out one of the best lines of this film well for a second i thought we were talking about a mask to me that that's the number two scene in the film and again has nothing to do with visual effects or anything it's just tom Cruise halloween is taken care of yeah right right yeah. all those things are being said so to me that's that's the top set, number two scene in the film for me that was uh, yeah that was an awesome i remember loving that when i saw it in theaters that was just like all right medicine yeah Woo! <laughs> I lo this is kind of like a two-parter. It's the same. It's the same concept in the scene, but it kind of sp splits up. The first, it's the Sophie Jolie's uh, Sophie Jolie switch. I like how it's revealed the first time uh, when he comes out of the bathroom and sh and Cameron Diaz comes up from around them in the bed and 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 then next thing you know he's in jail and they show you that picture of like I want you to see what you, what you did to her. That was like. Like, oh my God, there's, again, it was just one of those moments that felt so, it was like, I never expected in my life to see Cameron Diaz look like that. And then, and now, and you're telling me that the protagonist of the movie did this to her. That was, that was jarring. And I, I really liked how you don't know if. Like, at that point, you realize that you can't trust the lead character in the movie. You can't trust their narrative because they're, they're either lying to you from the future or they're having a mental breakdown in the present that you're watching. And either way, it's unreliable. But then the, the climax of, of, of that happening is when, of course, he's, he returns to the apartment, Cameron Diaz goes in the kitchen and then Penelope Cruz comes out and he's like, oh good, everything's good now. And then they're having sex later and it, she keeps switching back and forth and Cameron Diaz is like taunting him. And when he puts the pillow over her and the- uh, That's really the most confusing part of the movie because even you as an audience member don't know what the f is going on at that point in time. And the ed it's almost like the editing fell, um, like the, the editing got more jarring right there. Like the cuts got like quicker, weird splice cuts, like almost like he w his mind was breaking down how he was perceiving this. Mm -hmm. Like Jerry Bruckheimer cuts. Like all of them, I would say they were like Peter Fonda, like the old school, like back when they were, when they'd have to chop things up on the actual tape, mm -hmm. they, would, they would be those like weird jarring jump cuts, but it just, it's like the way the pillow jumps from right here, like, it's almost like I have no control over this happening, it's already done, it just, right. it jumps. I, but you've noticed that same thing happened when he was with uh, Sophia, but when he was really in love from the, the scene where she, her breasts were exposed, mm -hmm. it was the love, still yeah. no control, it's like, it's showing you like, wait a minute, if, 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 if in its simplest form, if you take a step back as a human being to just look, and if you were just looking at this, like, well, this is something wrong here. Why would that do that? Why would that do that? You now know you're not in reality. You're in suspended yeah. reality. 
the uh, the music in that scene too is just uh, like the rest of the movie. The music did that. Whoever was the and I, I'm pretty sure Cameron Crowe had a pretty um, heavy hand in where the music went and how it played into the the, the movie itself. But the the use of the music in that moment and using it, what if God was one of us and uh, and when he pulls the pillow down and he re- reveals the mole and he like. Either way, whether whether it doesn't matter who is under that pillow, he's killed somebody that he's that he cared about. Whether right. no matter how they're represented, this is this is Sophia. We know that it's somebody that he cared about, and he just killed her. And when that music comes back in, when he realizes it, when he catches up to where we are as the audience, and knows that that what he's done. It, the gravity of it is sold so well in the way the scene is, is brought to life. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I thought it was, it was one of my, that's almost like a tie for my number one favorite scene. Gotcha. My my, my number one scene is, ironically, uh, I'm, I'm going to dive more deeply into it than you did, was actually your number three scene, was when he got in the car with Cameron Diaz. That was my number one scene. And the reason for that being is I think that Cameron Diaz absolutely I, I don't remember seeing this the first time I watched it, but doing my rewatch, absolute. There's, I don't, I don't want to see anyone else. Even though we did the, the character switch before, I don't want to see anyone else playing that scene other than her, because it it, it reeks of sociopath. It reeks of just villainesque. It reeks of you know just to he she basically mirrored what what he what he was it was all about her and what mm-hmm. she wanted and it was all about him and what he wanted from her to be go from a to z she picked him up at a and by the time she drove off that f-ing bridge and hit the ground she was at z and this happens within the confines of real actual time watching maybe two and a half maybe three minutes max maybe and you are on a constri- a, a, a crescendo of of cinematic expertise at its finest almost Mm. as if they didn't even tell tom cruise what her dialogue was i was looking in tom cruise's eyes and i saw real fear like wait a minute like he was like no i love you he was trying everything he was i love you car uh let's go back to the house and talk about it we can do something and then he finally okay this shit ain't working pull the car over pull all right this ain't listening grab the way he went for every single thing you Uh know what she like she he had never been out of control until that point and to my point i'm like damn Cameron Diaz literally just f-ing killed this scene. And so, again, I don't remember feeling that way the first time I watched it, but I even got to admit it to you. Rewatching that, that was my favorite f-ing scene of the film, and and, and it, it really holds a lot of weight with me and what she did on that. So, yeah, that's my number one. Yeah, that's a that's it's a powerful scene. One, it, it is That is the pivotal scene in the movie that changes everything. Without that scene, there is no Vanilla Sky. Yes. My number one favorite scene is, it's another scene that is steered perfectly by the music and the choice of song that, that, they, that they place there. Good Vibrations, Beach Boys. You, uh, this, come on, this, come on, come on, come on. This movie changed this song for me. One, I had only heard the song in passing because it's a Beach Boys song and it just it's on the radio every now and then. But after I saw this movie, the movie made the song take on a whole new meaning, which is, I mean, when a movie can do that, when a movie can not only give you a good movie but also, also re like reinvigorate a song for for you, that's like a double win. So he. He, this like good vibrations begins playing as he begins to realize that he's lucid dreaming and then as the music builds he's he bursts out at he, he you know he pulls the mask off and reveals his face is still messed up and then he bursts out of the door as the music as the music comes to a crash and he's like i want to wake up i want to wake up tech support it's a nightmare it's a nightmare. Which you can't hear, because I didn't know what he said until I just looked at your nose. You're like, hey, hey, uh, hold door. Hold door. Hold door for all my Game of Thrones friends out there. He'll never watch it, but no. GOT. Hey, House hey, House Stark, baby. I just thought it was that. Uh, that was a fantastic scene, and that, that scene is not only my favorite scene, but made Good Vibrations one of my favorite songs. Awesome, man. Well, well, that's seven minutes of heaven, guys. And for me to find three scenes in Vanilla Scott that I really liked, I guess uh, there is there is a God. <laughs> Say that. No, there's not. All right, let's move on to You Are Gonna Need a Bigger Boat. 
These are our favorite lines from the film. We have condensed our, ourselves down to five, our top five lines from the film. My number five is uh, when David is tying up Jolie. If you notice, he says, I'm going to tie it four times because four times really means something. Mm -hmm. Thought mm -hmm. that was a clever callback. And it go and he almost says it under, like it's said in, uh, within so much chaos that you could miss it if you're not really well, listening. I didn't miss it. I didn't miss it. First off, it's shade. We I never miss shade. Number one and number two is just like I heard what you said an hour ago. I didn't really get it, but now I know you on some other shit, bitch. Here's four times because this really does. Now that means the same thing for you that it did for me, but this really means something. You know what I'm saying? So I yeah. I, I, I like that. Uh, m one of my uh, favorite quotes came, and I know we we're only really supposed. To, was it three or five? Five. Okay, cool. All right, thank you. I'll I'll. I'll I had about seven, weirdly. Uh, one of the first ones that caught me was, not all rich kids are soulless and not all psychologists are about dream, care about dreams. Yeah, that To was me, that. that was, like, it, it just goes to show you, like, like uh, we talked to, uh, when we talked to Brandon doing this episode, you heard him mention that, like, why would I give a fuck about this trust fund baby? Okay, that's one perspective, but again, I guess the person who wrote this was like, you know what, why would I give a fuck about this? Maybe I should have some sentiment on the other side saying, you know, not all, not all rich people are soulless like mm -hmm. you're gonna be who you are regardless in life whether you're born into money or not if you're a hard worker you're gonna work hard if you're an asshole you're gonna be an asshole and he obviously had a at, at least a conscious a conscience within him because this is your conscience talking <laughs> <laughs> he obviously had a conscience in him because this is all taking place within his his subconscious right and he's torturing himself so yes. that you're Unless you have a subconscious to feel guilty, there would have been no conflict within his lucid dream. It's almost like your left shoulder and right shoulder said, F*** you, Vessel, we're finna just go at it up here. Uh, yeah. So I, I agree with you on that, yes sir. Uh, my number four is uh, when Aaron, the guard, uh, played by Michael Shannon, uh, when his character bursts into McCabe and David's session, McCabe says, please leave right now, I'll take responsibility. And then David, almost childlike, uh, follows it up like echoes him and says please leave he's got control <laughs> at, at, very much so very much so leave right now he's got control so my point is that is that uh, here's the thing that lets me know that again subconsciously David still know as part of him still knows he's at, at LE because it, 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 we never see that at even when he was being as brash as he wore, was when he walked into the board at the beginning of the film, it's like, now tell me something, tell me a report. Like, like he was never really over ass holy, but when he says that, it has to like, yeah, he's in control. Mm -hmm. Because in, at the end of the bar, when, when tech support comes in, they tell him, like, you're in control. Like, he yeah. knows that. So I, I, I do like that. I, I didn't go in order from one to five, but I did make five. Uh, one of the other ones that I had was, I don't care if God calls, I'm very, very busy. It made me feel like he was Jerry Maguire for a second when he said that. So I, that's I, I, like I really the like that. Epic, that. That's like, like the Titanic parable. Like where even God can't sink this ship. Yeah. You know that ship's about to go down. It's going down so, hard. Same thing with David Ames. And he comes out and says something like that. It's like, okay, there's only one direction somebody can go from After that, that level. It's one thing to be an atheist, but to be an antagonist yeah, is exactly. different. <laughs> that, yeah, it's very nice. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. You can, Thank you can you. not believe, but don't antagonize. Don't antagonize. Yes. Thank you. Don't admit. Yeah. You, if you believe there's a God, don't be stupid about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my number three is after they almost get hit by the truck. Brian says, my my own death was right in front of me. You know what happened? Your life flashed before my eyes. And David says, how was it? He goes, almost worth dying for. It, it, but but it's, we, we spoke about that earlier in the episode. And so like I told you, that's 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 not only just one of the best quotes. It's really one of the, the key cogs to the, to the actual film itself. It's only a mask if you treat it that way. And what I took from that was it wasn't a metaphor as far as just a physical mask. It's like if you have a, how people say I have a disability. No, that's uh, my ability. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, like. No matter what, if no one, the only thing I can say is for, across all religions, atheists, and, and knowledge of whoever you are, is that we, no one is perfect. I, that's what I truly do know. That's what we all have in common is that no one is perfect. No yeah. one can say I am great or be, I'm the best at everything, and that's been proven throughout history. So with that being said, when she says that, it's just another little subtle jab and a subconscious jab in the film to say, listen, okay, oh, I'm crippled. Yeah, because I, I walk like this. Maybe you're a person that 
has uh, attention deficit or a hypertension, you maybe you need to move a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what I'm saying? Or oh, I don't have a bunch of muscles. Well, that's because this is your biggest muscle, your mental muscle. Like you need to read. You're a smart person. You yeah. see what I'm saying? So yeah. just because it's not a, it's not, it's not a, a, a con. It's a pro. Use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My number two on the rooftop tech support says, don't feel bad for him, David. He's your creation. It's in his nature to fight for his existence. He's not real. And McCabe, this is this is uh, Kurt Russell's uh, attestment to his awesome performance because he almost concedingly just says, I'm real. I'm real. And you could tell when he like he's saying something, feeling something else. Mm -hmm. Like he know like at that point you're watching him have the epiphany that oh shit. And he's like, I have two daughters. What's their names? That beat right there. I'm real. No, that that beat that he does right there, that's what separates I want to act from I am an actor. That mm -hmm. that beat. And kids, if you don't know what a beat is, David's going to put the definition right there. But a beat is simply when an actor does not use words. It's a, a, it's a line either that's delivered to them or that they deliver. And then there are moments after where they emote that line, not verbally, but emotionally. And that's what, when you meet, meet that synergy, that's what takes you to the next level as an artist. And he's saying the same line twice, but completely different performances to portray something different in each one the first one he's proclaiming it i'm real and then he takes that beat he thinks about it now he's he's now he's trying to convince himself and david with the second one i'm real but he's already lost all confidence it almost goes beat. in a jeopardy format rest in peace alex trebek uh we have to have that in the form of a question he's like <laughs> yeah, I'm, real. I'm, I'm real like if, if i'm not say something right now like <laughs> how heartbreaking is that too like him thinking like i have two daughters what's their names he now at that point he's not real he's, I, I, he, not only is he not real but these feelings that he had for these manifestations have been placed in right him, they're not real it almost made it is this seem what like the future of entertainment is the actual kurt russell got the rest of the script at that time like wait a minute I'm not real, yeah. like, like I think, because remember, no, because remember, he took the job, the role without reading the script, so he's yeah. like, I'm real, right? So that might have been real. <laughs> now that I think about that, might have been. I shouldn't move that. Look at me. You're in OJ land, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, guys, we don't yeah. need any explanation on that. That that says it all, right? That you're in OJ land, man. <laughs> That's, yeah, that I didn't catch that the first time I watched it, but were you in the rewatch that, yeah, I was like, oh my god, that's a really pointed reference. I know Brandon said the movie didn't age well, but that, that quote did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, my number one is uh, when he's getting the new prosthetic with the, uh, with the board of mm. doctors. That's great. For a minute there, I thought we were talking about a f***ing mask. That That is like, all right, Tom Cruise has now Tom Cruised in this film. So yes. I've at least got that much out yeah, of it. Yes, I, I agree with you, and I brought that up earlier. I did not not know that was going to be your one. But uh, my, my number one quote from the film, and this was my number one, I know I didn't do it in order, was once you've been driven off a bridge at 80 miles an hour, you don't let happiness in without a full body search. So he's basically saying, like, David, you should be happy right now. Like, hey, man. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Like, 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 he's letting them know, like, hey, man, listen. So even he has set up as we all have in our life, once we've been emotionally hurt or we've hurt someone, we set up boundaries not to be hurt. Mm -hmm. And again, I truly think that David's life, its a, it really this is a tale of how David's life spiraled down so much that he broke past every little mental barrier he had and that his subconscious was so strong, as they always tell us, the subconscious is very strong, that even life extension didn't have a safeguard for what he was going through. He wasn't the only one. At the time, they only had like 38 to 45 patients, and they already had tech support. So what does that yeah. tell you? That, that lends to the idea that he is controlling everything that's happening in his mind. And of course, it's going haywire because he's so guarded against letting happiness in. Yes, because he knows what will happen. So, yeah, there you go. Hey, guys, that was uh, that was going to you, you're going to need a bigger boat. Of course, a reference if we've never told you guys to the one of the best classic 80 movies ever. Jaws. All right. It is time for Scene Stealers. We have a clean slate on the board. and uh, Shout out Pam Greer, baby. You still do it for me. Yes, Pam Greer is, of course, our scene stealer of season one. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's start throwing people up on the board for season two. This is our favorite actor, actress, artist in the film. And um, I have one honorable mention, and then 
and then okay so let's go honorable mention then honorable mention then i'll go then you'll go so my honorable mention in this was mr kurt russell anytime that i get first off let me let me just be honest with you i can't even think of a movie where kurt russell's ever let me down uh maybe escape from uh la not new york was it which one was first escape from uh new york or la Oh, Lord, whichever the sequel head. was that one kind of yeah. let me down but outside of that kurt russell is as solid as it gets from overboard to freaking man i mean big trouble little china anytime you got kurt involved he really brings oh uh, also one of the lesser known movies if i'm not mistaken breakdown where him and his wife and his wife gets picked up by a trucker and he comes and find i mean like tango, this cat tango and cash oh geez don't do me that way yeah. tango and king cash good pull dave so uh with that being said he definitely gets my honorable mention kurt it's a pleasure to always see you on the screen brother hey listen wish you the best always go ahead um my honorable mention is cameron diaz uh which she actually won uh, and was nominated for quite a few awards i think one of the only actors in the movie that that has won oh, uh, an award for their performance in the movie i thought she was great at playing that girl who plays it cool but desperately once more. And she did that so well, so subtly. It was just so weird seeing her in a role like that. And the casting again was perfect for that because it was just a tragic was the best is the best way that I can that I could explain her her character. And it speaks to her talent that she's able to be totally hot and at the same time be completely unattractive like that moment at his birthday party when she's waiting for him half nude behind a robe and he's up there i'm like i i'm seeing the way she looks i know she's hot but i am i am feeling this scene through his perspective because of her performance that she is unwanted mm -hmm. and uh I, like for her to bring that to life, it was awesome, and it, like that 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 one shot of her where uh, Penelope Cruz says she seems to be crying. I think she's the saddest girl uh, ever to hold a martini. martini. Yeah. When it shows her, it's like it's such a simple shot where she's not really conveying any emotion, but you can see the. It's like the best over-the-shoulder shot ever in a film, probably ever. I'll, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll def definitely say that. So I and. Not to mention her range, she manages to be terrifying. Like, she goes for like, her desperation has her to, it, it, you can see it in her eyes. It, it takes her to a point of being unstable and capable of doing anything. Um, and yeah, so, and, and there was never a moment that I didn't believe that she was fully committed in what she was doing in the character. Okay. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. So, guys, what that brings us to is, and as David mentioned before, each season from every movie, we choose a best artist, uh, basically the best female or male in the film who really brought it to us the most that really deserves, uh, really deserve, really took us, not by surprise, but really elevated the performance and really carried the film in a way that uh, a lead actor or actress should. So, for me, for Vanilla Sky, and... It, it, I, I did, I did uh, mold over this and I thought about the reasons why I would do this and a lot of the criteria that we generally use is how much time did the person have in the film, did they have enough time to even be deserving of rewarding of a lead artist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was the script, did the script allow it, you know, so because if not, you know, we, they usually wind up in our quotes or our, our favorite scenes or whatnot. For me, for Vanilla Sky, Cameron Diaz. And I love that you said everything you said because it's a, hopefully it tilts my, <laughs> my uh, argument here when I say this. But to me, uh, listen, it's, it's generally hard for a person that's been in a lot of films for me to really captivate me with their acting. And the reason why I say that is we become so used to what to expect from this person it's almost like we're not we're not even worthy enough of when denzel or or brad pitt or, Rob, or robert de niro or edward norton they, we they've set the bar so not only i don't like to even call it setting the bar they've maintained the bar for so mm -hmm. many years that it's hard for them to surprise us yeah. when denzel won an oscar for training day I, I i know why he got it but i still felt like that's still not his best performance ever but that was what they wanted to see from denzel when i say they i mean the academy mm -hmm. and i'm not talking about the umbrella academy but with that being being said uh the cameron diaz generally i'd seen her for years before of course starting with the mask and oh, yeah. years after that she she's played roles she and this is not the first time she actually this might have been the first time she did it but she's done it since then when she was if i'm not mistaken bad teacher yeah. right? so to me I, I mentioned this to you earlier which is why i didn't want to go into it too much range you hit it on the head like listen 
I, I, it's easy to choose Tom Cruise in this, but to me, it's just Tom being Tom, and that's not a bad thing. It's just Tom being awesome yet again, and I'm not saying he shouldn't win it because of that. I'm telling you that Cameron Diaz has not been fully fleshed out in her career because people only see a blonde head girl that's funny and spunky. But what I saw from her in that film, without Cameron Diaz in that role, this film, I, I don't even know if I had enough courage to tell you I would rewatch it because I was not expecting this when I rewatched it. But I'm watching it. I'm five minutes into the fucking film and i'm like this bitch is crazy mm -hmm. she had already fucked him to sleep so she wanted to be the last voice he heard going to sleep and the first voice she's what do they say about subliminal messages the more you hear something in your sleep it's in you she wanted to to be a part of him physically mentally emotionally she did she did such she did her job so good that 150 years into a lucid extended life she was still him up man Cameron hey that's enough man Cameron Diaz to you sweet and you deliver one of the top 50 lines for all time I swallowed your <laughs> that means something you dropped a porn line in a non-porn film and they hey sweetheart if you're not on this board I don't know what Dave's thinking but go ahead man I, I, I agree with everything you said I spent I like and you actually see the deconstruction uh, is really interesting because she when you first meet her she is like every character you're used to her playing and then you watch that deconstruct before your eyes mm -hmm. into this into this troubled person yes and also tom cruise he would have been too easy to put on this list and mm -hmm. really it is it's tom cruise being tom cruise which is just awesome by default so i don't feel like there's any special kudos warranted there mm -hmm. uh jason lee I thought was uh, he's the one that I would like to put on the board and one because I love him from all of uh, Kevin Smith's films uh, uh, especially Mallrats he's awesome in Mallrats as Brody but in this movie he's like in every movie like this you have the comic relief but they are usually so two-dimensionally one note they are only there for the sole purpose of comic relief he was this like realistic beacon of lightheartedness and in a sea of like selfishness and v vanity he was the he was the balance to all that and he did it in a way that was it didn't feel like that was his mechanism in the movie he felt like it felt like a natural character within the story the way he brought it out and I just think it worked really well, and he did a great job. And plus, I'm I'm used to seeing him in ridiculous comedies, and to see him still being uh, comedic in this in this film that's not a comedy, he, you also saw this like there was you could see that he has the ability to have range, and I thought that was impressive. I was mostly surprised by his character, by his role, and how he his portrayal of that character. And then it's just in contrast to David, who's self-consumed, really careless with people, and uh, he supposedly cares about. Uh, Jason Lee's character was a was like the perfect contrast to that. Uh, I love how the roles totally reverse after David becomes when when they're in that club. And it, so you have the contrast between the club and the birthday. And at the uh, at the birthday, Jason Lee is the one that's getting ousted. He's the third wheel. And then it, it flips so subtly in the club scene where now Jason Lee is called there Tom, and Tom Cruise is obviously the third wheel and he feels that. I mentioned that to you earlier with the overhead shot. You see when they're leaving the club, you have Brandon Lee's character, you have uh, you have Sophia, and then you have Tom Cruise behind them, and now he's the literally the third wheel because it's like he's he's hobbling behind them. Mm -hmm. So with, with, normally we flip a coin. However, with this, I'm gonna let the videotape I think take the take the lead on this because again, I didn't know you were gonna choose her as your uh, honorable mention, but we're both saying the th same thing about Cameron Diaz. I, yeah. Dude, I love what Jason Lee did for this. To me, he's the number one villain in the film. But if I have to choose the number one artist, I must say that Cameron Diaz did something for me that that enough direct actors and screen cast uh, ca casting agents don't do for her to me she can play uh the spunky person like i say this uh from uh from uh three's company she can play that character all day in her sleep eyes because it's not a challenge to her what i saw her do in bad teacher and vanilla sky to me that elevates her to i i must have her on this board i agree uh, that's a, yeah. This is an easy one. We'll just take this as because there might not be many easy ones this season. Yes. So uh, yes. yeah, I totally agree. Cameron Diaz. Cameron Diaz, Diaz sweetheart, one. take off your mask, even though you were in the mask. Now the film connection. Hey, uh, get on the board. Ow! Congratulations.
congratulations to Miss Diaz. And that's hard to beat because you beat Penelope Cruz's tits, according to uh, Brandon. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and even I'll take your shirt off. <laughs> All right. Um, who is your favorite actor in the movie? Let us know in the comments. And with that, let's get on to cast, crew, or you. We have three guests for you this episode. Uh, three people that worked on Vanilla Sky. We'll be talking to Johnny Fedovich first. Then nope, we'll that's wrong. We're going to be talking to Johnny. One, two, three, Fedovich. <laughs> My apologies. And then we're going to move on to Michael G. Cahoe. And uh, lastly, we have a. We talked to David McGifford last season for Rain Man. And we kept aside a portion of that interview where we talked to him about Vanilla Sky. So we are going to be releasing that during this episode. So let's get on with the interviews. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you are in for a treat today. Our next guest is a drummer on the scene and in reality, sealed in movie history fame by Cameron Crowe as the beat behind Stillwater in the awesome film, Almost Famous. He made a cameo in Crowe's Vanilla Sky, reprising his same character, Ed Valancourt, leading to that theory that, hey, we might be living in the same realities here. So everybody, please, please humbly welcome John Fedovich. Thank you so much for taking time out with us today, sir. Hey guys, thank you. Thanks for having me. No, no problem. So let me ask you a question. Uh, let's get right into it. You still consider yourself a drummer before an actor, right? Is that is that the case? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. You credit your acting debut. Uh, your your basically you credit your acting debut in Almost Famous to a hometown friend, Mark Kozalek. Mark and I hooked up like when I, I wasn't even able to. Uh, thirteen, maybe twelve, thirteen. I just got my drums and. Yeah. I was playing in a church band and then we ended up rehearsing at someone's house and then Mark shows up and I was just like, who's this guy? We gotta, we gotta be in a big, this guy's gotta be a guitar player. Cause Mark's, Mark's actually a guitar player, but he was casted as a bass player in film. And uh, so that was my, when I first met Mark and I was like, oh, I'm gonna be in a band with him. And then forget about my brother, right? <laughs> forget about the band I'm gonna have with my brother. So Mark and I started a band together way before the Zooters. So it's, it goes way back. I was going to ask, can you tell us about that audition and what was it like to even, like I say, even landing that part? What was that like? I mean, it has to be like, you're, you're not just, you're landing a part for something you actually do. So that's, I mean, talk, talk about that, man. Yeah. So I uh, initially got the audition through through Mark because he was casted first. And I had, and then I was doing a gig at, at the Coconut Teaser in LA and Mark was in town. So I had him come up to the gig. So that was a whole reason. This is tiny. You know, I, I, he, he saw me at this gig and he was like, dude, you got to. I think you should audition for this thing that I'm doing. You know, it's a Cameron Crow film, and I'm gonna give your name to the casting uh, director. I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't act. I don't know what. You know, what's? So sure enough, a week later, casting director calls me. Hey, uh, we got your name, and uh, what was it? Would you be interested in uh, coming out to Los Angeles and auditioning for this film? And and I'm like, uh, yeah, uh, but you know. Back then, I didn't even, you know, Cameron Crowe, I know he did this film and I knew he did this other one, but I wasn't really that familiar. And then my girlfriend at the time was like, oh my God, it's Cameron Crowe, are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. She was freaking out more than I was. So yeah, so then I flew out to LA. Prior to that, they gave me a, you know, a small script to, to you know, read and memorize, which was kind of tough, you know, because I hadn't, you know, memorizing lines and stuff, I had never done that. And uh, so I just remember being uh, on gigs here in Vegas, because this is when I was living in Vegas at the time. And uh, I was rehearsing my lines between sets and stuff. I'd have the guitar player, oh, you be the, you be this person, I'll be myself. And we're, we're, let's, I want to practice my lines. And so we went through that whole process. And then I flew up to LA and auditioned with um, uh, the casting director. I think her name is Gail and Cameron Crowe. And um, it was awesome, man. It was, Cameron Crowe is so cool, man. It just, um, really like e easy to talk to and relate music stuff to and um he, of course he has a huge history in the music industry and in journalism and i was just like oh man this is cool this is so cool yeah and then and then so then a year later you're and i'm very i'm very interested about this because you reprise your role as ed valancourt in a cameo in in vanilla sky and I'm just, I'm curious how that conversation went, like how that was pitched to you. It, because I'm really, I'm secretly hoping that it that it clues us in on some kind of theory in the movie, like Cameron Crowe <laughs> said, I want this to be in a particular universe. And so like, how was that pitched to you? Okay, well anyway, that I don't know if this is gonna 
either be good or bad for how you think it is. But Cameron called me up and he's like, hey, I'm doing this film with Tom Cruise. Would you mind just, you know, coming down and being uh, one of the guys in the uh, in the club's, you know, restroom and you're going to make fun of Tom Cruise and, and uh, you know, you're going to kind of heckle him and, and make fun of him. And so I was just like, of course. And at the time I was living in Burbank and stuff. So it was like, yeah, I just drive down to the lot and we hung out and Mark was obviously casted too. And so Mark and I hung out and uh, that was it. I, there's nothing more than that. <laughs> he just called me up and said, hey, we just want you to come down and be these like kind of like background characters. And that's all, that's all I took from it. Yeah, you've, you've, you've yeah. resolved nothing in my soul. If anything, there's just more <laughs> questions now. <laughs> that film blows my mind. So I, I mean, I have to watch it. I should have watched it again to maybe get more, maybe if something would have clicked, but I'm just like, I don't know, man. I don't know. Let me ask you a question. Like you say, it was, it, it was, it was a quick decision. You drove down. Let me ask you this. Okay. So it maybe it was a quick drive down, but as you know, being, if you, as you've seen film and being on film, just because even though it's a quick scene, doesn't mean you're on set for two, three minutes. So let me ask you this for the brief time you had there, how long were you on set for? For that day, it was a whole day. It was just one day of, of, of shooting. I don't, I don't, I don't remember being, having to go back the next day or anything. So it was just, it was one day, but we were there all day. I mean, it was probably 12 hours or more. Yeah. It was cool to know that Tom Cruise and I are at the same height. We're about five, six, five, six and a half. So. <laughs> he's, a, he's a small dude, man. <laughs> so as an objective observer, what would you say your favorite scene in Vanilla Sky is? I, I gotta say, probably the scene where he's, he's in New York City and there's no one around. That's the one scene that comes, that comes around, you know, when it's New York City's you know, Times Square is totally empty. I'm like, that's incredible. Personally, from what you remember, did you have a theory on what you thought, what the hell, well, what the fuck was happening in this film? Did you ever just <laughs> ask yourself that at any time? I mean, you could run through the theories that it was a dream or that he was already dead or stuff like that, which are really good theories. Um, but that's that's about all I thought about it. Because we could, I, could, I guess you could look at it as he was already dead and maybe an afterlife or maybe a dream. And then you could also, you know, the simple, simple, was he dreaming this whole thing up or, um, but that's all I can, other than that, I'm like, I have no idea. Other, you know, I have no idea. Awesome. I want, uh, before yeah. we before we let you go, I did want to say this first. Again, we thank you so much for coming on. But listen, with this pandemic and everybody trying to get back to, as they call it, the new normal, with you being a full time musician, we know things can change here or there. But let, let me ask you this: Is there any are there any dates coming up that people can look out for where they can find you, and where else can they find you social media wise to see the things that you've done and you know find out more about you? If you look. Um... You know, you just uh, do the Asia or the Michael Cavanaugh. The, those are my two bands that I've been touring with the most in the over the years. And I'll be in Florida actually uh, May first, uh, playing with Asia. I'm not sure where it's at. I feel I have to look that up. It's, and I'm kind of like, is it really going to happen or not? So I'm like, you know, we'll see. If you look on Facebook and uh, Instagram, I have a bunch. I usually I usually keep up to date on that. Just with with you know pictures of drums or my dates or, or okay. music or links of stuff. Um, most recently, um, I did a virtual thing with Michael a few months ago um, in November when um, that's, that's out there somewhere on the ether, whatever. Well, ladies and gentlemen, today, once again, we had Johnny one, two, Three Fedovich with us, and listen, man. Hey, listen, we we wish you nothing but great success this year and moving forward, man. Please keep being who you are, man, and just and we appreciate you taking the time out to be on the show. We're gonna make you look good. You made us look good, man. And hey, peace and blessings to you, sir. Yeah, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. anytime, anytime, guys. Thank you, man. So when our next guest isn't cooking up films of his own, he's actually cooking on the film and TV sets of other projects. Michael G. Keho is a filmmaker and craft service manager who has worked in the industry for over 35 years. From the amazing sets he has been in to his own first-hand experience producing films, we are very excited to dive in and soak up as much insight as possible. So the, the, the first question that I had just to kind of get things in motion here is that I saw you were born in uh, in Brooklyn before moving upstate where you attended the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New York City. Then you moved to California to pursue filmmaking. So it sounds like you've had the bug for a while. And I'm, uh, this is something that we kind of ask everybody that's 
whatever they're doing when was that interest sparked and what sparked it well if anybody's watching this i want you to know you know the glasses are for seeing not for you know uh, uh being some kind of hollywood uh, dick but um i you know my my mother was involved in community theater and uh racing we i was uh, attending a school uh, by the name of saint jerome's which is a catholic school and in brooklyn it was a very diverse area where i lived you know we had all different races, all different religions and whatnot. But I, you know, I was attending a Catholic school where nuns were there who were kind of brutal. And um, my mother would direct these shows and these plays to raise money. And I think I was around maybe seven years old and watched her uh, organize these things and, you know, um, and directing people on set or on the stage there. And I knew right then and there that there was something that, that attracted me to that. You know, and my mother and father were very much, you know, very animated in their lives, very funny. My dad was kind of like uh, uh, Jack Nicholson, you know, with an Archie Bunker kind of like uh, not a racist attitude, but that delivery, you know, of what he had. He was very funny. My mom was uh, uh, extremely talented as far as that, you know, that goes. And she loved film. And um, I think that's the reason why I got into it at a, an extremely early age. Awesome. Let me ask you this: what, what was what's the best piece of information you got coming out of art, an art school like that? I mean, what is, what is that knowledge? What is that? What do you take with you from an experience like that? You know what what I got out of it was learning the language of an actor. You know that was important because you you know as a filmmaker you either know everything about the human element and nothing about camera and the crew, or everything about camera and crew and nothing about the human element. And so my language or my communication with the actors, because of my education from the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, it actually enhanced my the moments you know on film behind camera. I wasn't trying to like search for the things to do because I knew, you know, I get the feeling of um, of being on stage, back you know behind the curtains, talking like an actor would talk, and you know communicating with, with that. Um, uh, not until I really started working with Cameron Crowe and watching him, I started with Jerry Maguire and um, and watching him on set, he used to play music to um, immerse the actors in that in that sense and that feel, you know? And, um, you know, I stole that from him, you know, in, in some moments of, of what we do, but uh, it really helped. It helped the actor, it helped the crew and, um, you know, so the, the education from the, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts helped me in that sense to communicate with actors. Looking through your credits, both as an actor and in craft service, we noticed quite a few Tom Cruise projects from Jerry Maguire to the Mission Impossibles to Vanilla Sky. Is there, like, from an outsider's perspective, it seems like Tom Cruise is, like, personally vetting you on everything he does, but is there... Is there a story there beyond that, or is it just is it just you being awesome at what you do? And well, I mean, I I don't consider myself awesome at what I do, but you know, I mean, there's a, a you know on this job, it's kind of like it's kind of like a, a you know a, a a restaurant that has they specialize in one thing. So you would go to an Italian restaurant for this or a Japanese restaurant for that. And that I think is what goes on with craft service from these guys. So when I did Jerry Maguire, um, I got the job uh, through a producer and some friends of mine. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess we, you know, I did okay. And uh, um, the producer who uh, was on the next show saw that I worked there. And that's how I ended up going in and doing that. And that's how I ended up working with with Cameron Crowe as well. Yeah, I wanted to talk about Vanilla Sky. Of course, that's mainly what this episode is about. The The first thing that stood out to me was that the the fact that you were, you did the craft service work on the film. That went uncredited, at, at least in the scrolling credits. But then you also play a chef on screen, which you were credited for. Like, how did how did that come to be? It was Cameron, you know, and, and, and they would say, uh, while I, you know, while I was on the set, and I was always around, I was always watching, you know, Cameron from the sides or, or whatever, and, and watching him communicate. And um, I had been in Jerry Maguire with a small scene with Cuba Gooding and Tom that Jer that they put me in, 
So he knew that I, I guess I could, I could act, you know, but I, I didn't go around telling people, hey, I'm an actor, I'm in SAG, I did this, I've done that. It just came out. And um, so, you know, Cameron said, uh, get Mikey, tell him to come over here. We'll, we'll, there's a kitchen sequence here, Tom comes in and we'll have him in there. It was, if you blinked, you'd you'd miss, you know, the moment, you know, which uh, is is what it is. But it was, uh, that's how, it, that's basically how it happened. It was just that moment, they had things going on and pointed to me and said, go get him, send him to wardrobe. And then, you know, it happened. Is there ever like, I know there's this, there's the degree of professionalism that you have to keep and and you're and it's just like so it's kind of normalized where you're uh you're on all these sets a lot of the times but when like something like that happens where cameron crow is just like can you jump in front of the camera is there like a part of you that's like oh god i'm 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 now in a cameron crow film like just like that or or is it just or is it just like a normal day at the job? Like, oh, this, I'm, instead of doing this, I'm doing that, no big deal. I, I think what happens is you, you you have these modes, you shift. And because of my education and everything else, it shifted. I do get that feeling, but it's not until afterwards. So mm -hmm. if I'm on set, you know, and they say, hey, can you do this? Yeah, I'll do it. Then I go in, I start thinking about, okay, my acting ability or what would I do in this? And then taking, you know, the direction and finding out what's going what's going on it's very intimidating when you you know you have to hit your mark you have to make sure that you're not moving around you know because the focus puller is your best friend you know if you're not if your actors do this you know sometimes when they're in a scene and that's the hardest thing in the world so with that in mind i said okay i'm not I'm, you know i'll do this i'll do that and then i make my decisions on it but i listened to what cameron had said after it was over i would go in and i'd go out and they say you were in that i'd say Oh shit. yeah, I was. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, the celebration always comes afterwards, you know. I uh, but working with actors sometimes is a um, is a real treat, and you get you know you you're awestruck. It did happen to me one time on a movie called Art School Confidential, and Anne Bancroft was there, and I had to say something to her, and you know she's married to Mel Brooks, and uh, mm -hmm. I remember watching The Graduate, and I said to um, I said to her, I, I, I've got to say this to you. And she's looking at me and I said, um, you know, because of you, I got my first erection. And that was from, that was from uh, the graduate, you know, with her being that way. Cause I was a little kid watching it. And I said, holy shit, you know? And she laughed, you know, was very, you know, felt like it was an incredible compliment, you know? And, <laughs> uh, and you know, just, I, I didn't want to hold back. And then, you know, she smiled and always, you know, waved to me uh, uh, during the course of the day. She was there, there for about a week, maybe. But um, even on on Vanilla Sky, uh, working with you know Kurt Russell was remarkable. Watching him and um, Michael Shannon, who was in it as well. You know, he he was amazing. You know, nobody knew him on the set. They didn't know what was going on. And I watched him, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I didn't know who he was at first, and I thought, this guy's a this guy's like a stage trained the way he is in doing it. And sure enough, yeah. you know, he was. Speaking of underrated actors, I was going to say this. There's different levels of actors, of course. Uh, there, There's what some people call D-list, C-list, B-list, and even the ones that we really feel that really entertain us, those are like, like the top-notch actors. But then there's the Mount Rushmore's, the megastars, the icons, and the almost mythical godlike features. So when you work with someone, Tom Cruise is obviously at that status. He he checks off all the boxes. Right, how do they say it? the women want to be with him and the men want to be him? And with that being said, let me ask you this. What was it like to work with him, to be a co-worker of his, even if it's just for a split second? You were there, you've been in his films. What's it like to work with someone with a persona like that? When I was doing Jerry Maguire, we were in uh, Arizona and there was a moment when Tom had left and had to go to his trailer. And uh, he said, come on. And in front of all these people, the crew and people in the stands, I ran with him across the field. It was the first time that I, I was with him. And that was a moment of saying, oh, we, you know, we talked and, and, and uh, it, it, you felt that. But the, the thing about Tom is he's really concerned about you know what the what's going on with the movie so you have this 
air of uh, this royalty around the set and what's going on with, you know, with that. But then in, when he gets in front of the camera, it changes, you know, he's one of the team. Let me ask you a question. Now, of course, you've seen the film, you're in the film, and like you say, uh, we watch these things. What was your favorite scene from Vanilla Skies, visually appeasing? So what was your fav favorite scene from it? I think it was the revelation uh, that, you know, with Tom and the, and, and the face. And I, like I said, I watched Cameron uh, do that, and I never expected some of those moments in there, but Tom was pretty remarkable, you know, uh, um, in those moments there. And uh, I, um, I was on set for when that was going on. In fact, afterwards, uh, I stole, well, I didn't steal, in the trash they had thrown away these, uh, I still have them, these little Polaroid uh, shots of the mask and, uh, and that. And I said, you know, I'm gonna keep these and maybe someday uh, I'll show them to somebody or give them my kids for whatever. But they were in the trash. So, you know, what am I gonna, you know, what am I gonna do? I said, well, nobody's gonna want these, you know? That's one of the moments of, of seeing Tom on a different level. And, and and watching that and and like you know when I, when I mentioned Kurt Russell as well, you know you all of a sudden you started thinking, is this a dream, or is it real? And I was confused throughout the whole time because I don't read the script when I get when the crew gets it because I want to be you know I want to sit and watch it in the theater and understand you know the story that way. And uh, I, I I was on so many different levels with all of the actors. I was extremely impressed. If you had to land on one theory, like at the end of the day, what would you say is, is happening? Like more specifically, what do you think the ending means that he hears uh, Sophia's voice before he is, before he opens his eyes again? You know, it's, uh, when I thought about it being a dream, I also thought about it um, being death and, mm -hmm. I wanted to leave it that way with me. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to try to, uh, you know, try to analyze it in such a way and come up with an answer. So um, it, I, I love films and it's why I'm inspired that, that go one way and then take a, a sharp curve. And with this, it was almost going to the edge of a cliff and do you jump or do you not jump? What is it, you know, what is the answer? And um, that's how I left it with me. I was, uh, I was extremely, you know, confused in the beginning. And then I kept saying, wow, you can make your own decision on where this goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. That's, I, that's I, good. I agree. That's, we, we, we said it this earlier, that if you have to keep discussing it and talking about it, then the film's done its job. That's what film is right. open to interpretation and we should be able to have those, those, those discussions. Right, right. And everybody does have a different interpretation. What was that set like, man? Because with me and him, we always say when we're doing a film, we want to be on a set where number one, we hold everybody accountable. But again, we don't, we don't like to belittle people or demean people. So we just really like nice sets to where we can get the job done. So what was that set like with all these different people and talents on set? It was very, it was a controlled atmosphere when, when we were ready to go, you know, and, uh, uh, yeah, I think uh, Yana, uh, Cameron, who you know really uh, uh, controlled the set, you know, had everything in place for it. And so when you walked in there, you know, prior to the actors coming in, there's chaos, and it's controlled chaos in that sense. And then as soon as the actors come in, and people stop, and they and they you know and they're they're ready to work. You watch, you're watching magic. I, I, that's how I look at it. To me, it's magic. And uh, all of a sudden, someone is speaking, and there's. There's something going on in the in the communication, and then someone else, and you get lost in that if you're you know if you're just taking for the moment to see that. Some people say, oh yeah, there's Kurt Russell, I, and he's talking, and they're thinking, yeah, I saw him in the thing, and I saw him in this, and and then they're not getting it. But I sometimes what I'll do is I'll watch the set of what was going on, and then I watched Cameron at the monitor, and how he was. Sometimes, you know, uh, speaking the words that the actor was speaking, you know, it, whispering it or, you know, mouthing those words and then leaning in and, and, and watching what was going on, almost as if he knew what he was going to do in the next take to move the camera. And so to me, that was, uh, I just take it differently than some people. And some people take it the same way, you know, but it's, uh, um, it's such a wonderful experience seeing an, a, a director like that communicate with the actors and the magic that goes on on the other side. 
Is there a uh, is there a particular memory that stands out from the from the time on that production? Yeah, it was uh, in the um, interrogation room, uh, which you know stands out to me because uh, you know I, I like dark films, you know, and I like dark sets. So when I went on the set itself, I remember thinking, "Wow, I love this set." You know, during during those moments when the actors were in there, it had a whole different feel. It's kind of like you have this empty glass and you like the glass and all of a sudden the liquid that goes into it is, you know, the sparkle, the bubbles, all these things that are, you know, that are inside it give this feeling that you have. And then the taste of it, of watching it is spectacular, you know, and I, I don't know why every time somebody says to me, uh, what did you think of Vanilla Sky? Boom, I go right to the interrogation room. Before, before we let you go, and once again, thank you very much for taking the time. It has been uh, insightful and a pleasure. It's like we're having a beer somewhere or something. It didn't even feel like an interview, so thank you for making it easy like that. This, is, to me, was more of me being myself. Unfortunately, like I said, I can't see without so these, uh, these glasses and not being able to find the ones that are clear. But We should, we should have made you feel more comfortable. We should have made you feel more comfortable. Yeah, there, there we go. There we go. There we go. All right. There we go. All right. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> come on, David. You can do it. Come on. Come on. Get with the... Pr there we go. Everybody's on the same page. All right. Just a bunch of douchebags hanging out. Talking That's how we do it, baby. <laughs> I'm so happy that you reached out to me. And I, 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 feel, uh, I feel fortunate. And uh, I think that there's a lot of creativity coming out of uh, what you're doing. So... I want to I want to get involved. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much. And again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Listen, you're, it was very you're a very genuine soul and we wish we wish you nothing but the best with your career and hopefully like I say we'll we'll keep this partnership going. It's two-way street and I appreciate everything you did today. Thank you very right, much. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank you so much, man. Thank you very yes, much. Too. Have a good night. I know last night when we talked I mentioned that uh, so season 2 we're covering Vanilla Sky and I wanted to take a few minutes to to talk about that project. So this is 2001. You're working with Tom Cruise alongside the incredible director Cameron Crowe. The opening scene with Tom Cruise running around a seemingly empty New York City and Times Square. How do you even go about beginning to make something like that happen? Well, uh, I think it was eight lines in the script, something like that. So when I read it first, I said, wow, that is going to be one cool special effects shot. And, and then I found out what Tom and, and, and Cameron wanted, which was a, a live action shot. So that, that was the first thing that just completely blew my mind um, for obvious reasons. So we hired a specific production manager and a team of people who had to go out to every business in Times Square that was going to be impacted by where we were going to shoot. And they had to s sign contracts with them, make deals with them to keep their stores closed, had meetings with the nurse office and the film office. And we had to figure out how we were going to shut down traffic, how they were going to reroute buses, how we were going to hold up pedestrians. It was a, a big deal. It took a, a, an incredible amount of time by an incredible amount of people. Then when they told us that we could shoot on a Sunday for four hours, I think it was, uh, then we had to figure out how were we going to get everything in and out and get the shots we needed in the four hours. So John Toll, the cinematographer, came up with the idea of uh, we went to an empty lot in Brooklyn and we laid out the basic layout of Times Square that we needed. And then we practiced how Tom would come in, where the crane would be, how the guy with the steady cam would get onto the crane and rise up and what the other shots would be and how we would all work the equipment around and then how we would get it off and, and on. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's what it took. I had a hundred days. I didn't have, we, our production team had a hundred PAs for that night. They had to, uh, they started um, clearing the streets at like two or three in the morning. It was really foggy. A couple of them had the hell scared out of them because people threatened them and stuff. We had coffee bars off to the side of every street just out of shot where if people had to go somewhere and we were holding them up during the shooting we'd give them coffee and the pas would talk to them about what was going on um it was a big deal L let me ask this was that the most challenging part of the production or did something manage to top that or was there some or was there more like a more rewarding moment for you from the production it, it was absolutely the the most challenging i mean i i the scale of that i mean we when we shot that thing, honest, 
uh, honestly, uh, Tarian, there was nothing but pigeons in that shot when we started. There was nobody, not a car, not anything, as far as you could see down like three streets. So it, it, that was the most challenging. But the other one was he, 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 he the car leaves the Dakota, right? Where's where John Lennon used to live or something and comes out onto Central Park West and goes south on Central Park West toward Columbus Circle. We had to shoot that too. And we were holding people down in the subways we were, you know, we, we blocked traffic off, holding people out on the side streets, holding them down the subways. They get, people get pissed off. You know, they're like, we're not, you know, you can't. And uh, so that was pretty tense. And the dailies didn't look good. We went back the next day and did it again. So, and we knew then what we were dealing with. A lot of times, if you don't know what you're dealing with, it's not so hard. You can just go in and, oh, wow, it's really weird, but thank God it's over. And now we had to go back and we were like, oh no. So that was weird. You know, that was a huge team effort. Everybody on the crew and the cast were, just did it. It was cool. Tom Cruise, this, I want to make this clear. Tom Cruise has been quoted, just Tom, has been quoted as saying that Vanilla Sky is the best film he has done. Now, I'm going to ask you, because I've enjoyed this interview, and you know, you're a pretty intelligent guy, and I, and, I, and I just, I feel like I know where your heart's at. If you had to choose... Just throwing this out there. Tom's not here. Nobody's here. If you had to choose between Rain Man and Vanilla Sky, which one, in your expert opinion, would you say is better? As far as Tom Cruise's acting? No, 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 no. no. Just, 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 just if, you, if you're going to bed at night, you got your milk and cookies, you just need to wind down. You're just winding down at night. You want to feel good. No, you can't. Uh, you no, can't. no, he asked me. I'm. Lead, he asked me. You can't put it I'm, under the pretext of He gave me a down. canvas and I'm painting. Let me paint. Yeah, go ahead. This is the last movie you're ever going to see. World's ending. What you watching? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I'll go with Rain Man and I'll tell you why. My Emmy style, baby. <laughs> no, no, no. But, but here, here's why. If you're talking about if I'm going to bed. Now, if I'm just getting <laughs> up and I want to have a day where I got to think about stuff, then I'm going to go with Vanilla Sky. Oh, because yeah. honest to God, look, Torian, Torian, I got to tell you something. There were days on that show, on Vanilla Sky, where I would have crew people come up to me, um, hey man, um, can I talk to you for one second? Sure. So, do you, do you know what this scene is about? <laughs> do you know what we're doing here? And there were a lot of times where I had to say, honest to God, I, I haven't got a country clue. I, I don't. Because, and, and, and look at, I think, hey. But but I think that's both its most difficult point and its best point because it's it's hard if you want it to be logical and make sense. But if if you're the kind of person that likes to like you know go for the implied and and go for the is it a dream is it a time slice is it a you know all those things that they came up with to me it felt like a dream more than anything and and a dream bordering on a hallucination with some slices of reality to give it a basis to kick off from but that's kind of simplistic but i'm simplistic that way i i i, I don't know what the hell some of those people came up with as interpretations honestly yeah i mean that's <sighs> yes. um uh, you, that that was kind of the answer to my next question about the there's that's one of my favorite things about the movie is uh, even Cameron Crowe says, wherever deep you want to go with this, the movie will meet you there. And he's actually put out six uh, approved theories, theories for, for what the... I mean, if you have six theories, do you have one? <laughs> yes. I'm asking questions. That the, they want to know these things. Yes, it's, he's playing three-dimensional chess. All right? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. but uh, does, does a... Actually, you, you can take that question. No, okay, so let me ask you this. Was there a particular scene that, I mean, we're still Vanilla Sky here, was there a particular scene for you that stood out as your favorite? Not, and I know we talked about the most difficult scene, but if, like you said, if, like you said, if you want to think, and obviously you're a thinking man, if you want to be cerebral, what scene really made you think? Oh, I think in the Institute, when they were doing those, those interviews in the Institute, I, that's to me big time. Uh, yeah. You know, I was trying to follow it and figure out like how that fit into what, you know, David was going through and how did 
you know, how did these actors come into this? Did we, I know they were in another scene, but how does that work with this? I, I had, a, uh, I was pretty spun when we were filming that, trying to track how that would fit in. Um, but you know, the thing, the thing that I liked about it, I did like its open-endedness. I did like that it was hard to figure out. Um, and uh, I worried that people would just blow it off because they couldn't figure it out, right? You know, so why would you make a movie that is so open to interpretation? I'm not, you know, and I, but for me, it was uncomfortable too, uh, because it was hard to figure out. And, um, but I, I think, you know, what I did was I read a whole bunch of different viewpoints of it and then kind of, uh, okay, that part makes sense. This part makes sense. He nailed that part. That was good. And I kind of did that for myself and it helped me. But when we were shooting it, I understand, you know, it was, it was confusing. Thank you for that. No, no, let me just say thank you because you know what? I, I don't know. Listen, we've done a lot of interviews this season, but I'm telling you, I've already, I'm nominating you for the most honest guest award. Just thank you so much for that. That's making me. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it two more times now because you were just so honest. I'm going to give it two more watches. All right. Thank you very much to our guests, David McGifford, Michael Cahoe, Johnny123 Fedovich. Yes. And uh, with that being said, let's get on to Room for Improvement. And with that said, David, I know I said I was going to let you go first. However, well, before you go, look uh, look what I have for Room for Improvement. FG, 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 FG. That's just a placeholder for before I put my thoughts. But I, I do have something. Oh, I didn't think you did. I didn't, but I got, I got okay. it now. Uh, okay, so I'll just go first real quick. Uh, for me, room for improvements on this, there are clearly a lot of areas that could have been approved on. Uh, generally, when you're doing a film, you want to see, you want your film to age well. And and if your film doesn't age well, that can be due to graphics that's outside of your control, uh, but storyline, things of that nature. But for me, if I were to make any improvements on this film, I have to say, I don't want to make any improvements on this film. And I know that's strange to David Polanski. No, but the it's reason... not. I know where you're going. No, 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 no. I, I don't want to make any improvements on this film because I still feel as if a director, a writer should be allowed to still tell their story without the studio exists. It's more so of a, more so of a, uh, a, a fight against studio execs saying what can and cannot be done. One of the things I respected about this film was that when we were doing our research, which we do, is that the director, Cameron Crowe, who was unavailable to make it to us, he is scheduling conflicts, things of that nature. But one of the things I respected was that the studio execs came down on him and said, after 9-11, we want you to remove these twin towers out of it. And I said, uh, he said the same thing I would have said, which was hell no if I would had the chance to say that, because it's not that I'm being disrespectful, but it still reserves a time when they were, you, they were there now. Mm -hmm. So if they were there, I want to be the I, I've worked too hard in my life. I want to be the last film that was allowed to use the Twin Towers after that everybody has to digitally remove them. But furthermore to the film, the reason why I don't want to change it, because at the end of the day, um, when I originally watched this film, it did disturb me immensely, immensely, immensely. But as I've grown as an artist since then, and I will at least say this is that the reason why I don't want to change anything about this film, because I still think it serves as a learning tool for people to still feel courageous enough to put their on regardless of what people say i'm still going to do this film the way i want to do it and in that light i do like it because of the fact that that it was still the story that was being told that the director wanted to tell so i wouldn't change anything about them it's not a perfect film by far there are continuity errors there are uh chopping errors there's there's things that could have been done differently up and down this film but from that perspective again I still respect the fact that at the end of the day, this is a story that I know that Cameron Crowe wanted to tell, so I don't have any room for improvement from that perspective. Kind of sounds like you're washing your hands. Uh, hey, listen, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna wash my hands with this I'm gonna wash my hands with this Hey, KD! KD! If I could change one thing, it would be that elevator scene at the end when they, when they pretty much just break it all down for the dummies. Like, that, that whole scene up where tech support is just just over explaining everything like yes this is what happened this is the moment you chose your splice this is when you died I feel like that could have all been conveyed in a way without the 
without so much explaining. Yeah, just take out the dialogue. You take- are all over the fucking place, dude. Even from season one to season now, you do this shit every episode. No, the one thing you always have a problem with anytime you want to change something about the film, it's always the ending. You didn't like yeah. the ending in Rounders because that's the uh, most because, important part. Stick the but landing. no, because whether they wrap it up too much or don't wrap it up enough. You're never satisfied. Oh, I, I'm. I am satisfied. Well, I'll, I will. Ex- you'll meet my satisfaction with an ending when we cover No Country for Old Men later okay. this season. Okay. Okay. But th- yeah, just. I mean, have that for an alternate version where you can click commentary on if you're if you're a dum dum and you want it all. Just this is what happened. I don't want this is what happened. Not with a movie like Vanilla Sky. With a movie like Vanilla Sky, I want to be left to my own devices. Explain less. Show me more. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, well, hey, guys, that's room for improvement. I'm pretty sure he thought it was going to be filled with a lot more. But hey, David, tell us about the next segment, and it's called it's Given. In this segment, we have five middle fingers that we can give to a film depending on how much we f*** with it. So, I'm just going to go ahead and put it out there. It's no surprise to you, and I do have a few notes about to back up why I'm giving it five f***s. Out of how many? Out of five. Because to me, this this is the perfect film experience. And everything that Cameron Crowe set out to do he did exactly he it was the delivery was perfect on every level from the music to the editing to the casting the performances the story the way they chose to piece it together chronologically within the confines of the film I think it was all great I had not seen this movie in over over a decade before I watched it the other night I remembered every moment I realized that as I was watching, I knew exactly what was coming. I could anticipate the visuals. I could, I could hear the music that was about to play. I could feel the emotion that it was about to bring me to. So at least for me, this movie struck an emotional chord that stuck with me for over a decade in a part of my memory that just stays, where I have, I have forgotten the most important shit between then and now. But Vanilla Sky... I could see it all in my mind's eye, even if I haven't watched, even if I didn't watch it the night the, the night before. The other thing I wanted to say is that you can't watch this movie like a linear story from a reliable narrator. You have to you have to come into this movie appreciating it like uh, like an emotional parable. It's a parable about ego, life, relationships, karma. You you have to take it in like a dream. It's just an experience. It's not it's not A B C done. It's just, what are what emotions am I getting from this? What messages can I pull from this? And those are the things to appreciate it for. And then it's just a bonus that it is backed by an amazing soundtrack. Not only is it a fantastic collection of songs, but all the songs Cameron Crowe used strategically to have meaning in their timing and placement in the movie. Like, I don't think it gets enough credit for not just the songs it was used, but how the songs were used. Uh, they... It's if you're like taking a course on how to score or how to how to put music to a film, I think this is the perfect example for how to do that the most effectively, almost to a almost to a fault because there's the music almost takes over the film. When uh, and and Brandon brought it up how he how they keep calling back the of the fear of heights. I think that that was. Uh, I, I enjoyed that aspect of it. Like in the beginning of it, when he's standing on the edge of the table, that was like a, a visual foreshadowing of how he was going to, I mean, he, he could have already been on the edge of the building at that point. Um, I thought that was awesome. And McCabe, he says, let's continue. Time is not our friend. Um, this is just something that I loved. <laughs> Another Tom Cruise being Tom Cruise. After he says time is not our friend, uh, David does this like weird like Joker interpretive dance before he jumps up and grabs the bars and just shakes them. And there's no, there's no like like where did that come from? Tom Cruise. Exactly. <laughs> and and the fact that it was left in, and. They got the reaction shot of uh, the, Kurt the secu- Russell. No, and the security, and the guard, security guard. The, the, the cop's like, uh, are we a rewrite? <laughs> <laughs> that, I'm like, you know what? Yeah, cool. I like it. What I like about this is that it feels like 
it on the surface it feels like your typical like hollywood blockbuster romance drama just if on the surface level but it it does this crazy thing where at while it's while it's looking like that on the surface if you go beneath the surface there's so much subtlety waiting waiting there for those that dare to scratch like I just I, the 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 range of the movie itself I thought was impressive. F for me, what really made this a five movie is it is a deep emotional journey. You are on the ride from David Ames' perspective. The movie manages to make you feel what he is going through and to literally go through it with him. Especially when he becomes disfigured, you f you feel that desperation. You like you long for like uh, Tom Cruise doesn't look good. What is wrong with the world? Like so everything feels off. When he's having a, a good day after he's disfigured, he starts like getting his life back in order. You feel that too. You're like, okay, we can live with this face. We can make this work. Look at it. We're making it work. Like it's all steered by his by his energy, by how he's feeling about what what's going on. We're on that ride up and down with him and it makes total sense when at the end tech support explains that this is all in his head and we are we are the panel of observers that are just monitoring this so i just it's, it's an amazing movie okay uh i'll start with uh tom cruise i just had a with me listen we, we we have to get at least five more subscribers on our show by doing that because that's when he went on oprah and she says the line the boy is gone. The boy is gone. I mean, he did some Mission Impossible f***ing Jabberwocky jump up from his seat to stuff. I want to go ahead and um, full transparency. We don't discuss films uh, before the show. We just decide which film we're going to do, and then we go right into it. And I want to be completely transparent. The first time I saw this film was probably in 2003 or four. At the time, I am nothing but an actor at the time, and I am all about uh, my favorite form of acting, which is method acting. So. To me, I wanted to broaden my horizon, my range, because I just didn't want to be known as a black actor. I didn't want to be known as a hood actor, a funny actor. I just wanted to be known as an artist and to be, no, be known as a great actor, regardless of my color. Um, so I started venturing out to watch other films like of people I knew. I didn't know how to watch other films first, so I started watching films that I like. Well, this is not an action movie. Why Tom Cruise be in it? Which led me down the, the rabbit hole, which I chose somebody very good because that introduces so many things from Scientology to this, that, and the other. And if you notice throughout the film, one of the things that I noticed, I'm always, they kept mentioning uh, seeing you in another life and they kept mentioning cats. And if you don't know this, it's an Egyptian type of, uh, in Egyptian folklore that they use cats to update it when they money five people. That's a, a passage into another life. So that's mm -hmm. one of the other things I saw about the film that I really liked. But I'll say this, the first time I saw this film, Skiven wasn't around and neither was TTFT show, but I had gave this film negative 55,000 fucking fucks because of the fact that to, to me, this was a shit show of a project. It was a waste of Tom Cruise's time. It was a waste of, I just thought Cameron Diaz was trying to venture out into something she had no idea what she was doing. I didn't know who Tilla Swinton was. I didn't know Johnny Galecki was in this. I didn't know my name was Earl was gonna be invented. Like I knew none of these things were happening. And so when this film made it into season two, needs to say I was highly disappointed. Not as a co-host, but I was disappointed as a fan of film because I'm like, what person in their right f***ing mind would have this film? Like, I, is this must be a f***ing joke. It's like the Russia election. This shit get hacked, but, but the truth was the truth. We monitor the results. And with that being said, I have a duty and I have a job to this show to always be 100% honest about what I feel, what I've seen, and what I've done. And I must be completely honest with you. It pains the f*** out of me to say this, but one, if I, I went from negative 55,000 to I give this film three and a half fucking fucks. This is actually a good fucking film, and I don't know where the fuck the world is going. I'm not saying this for subscribers. I'm not saying this for satire. I'm not saying this for he hasn't paid me to fucking say this. I literally must be delirious in the world I live in now. I must be at life extension. But I can't, I can't contain the smile. Oh, yeah, I bet, good. and I can't put one on my it's face. Gold, but, but you have to understand. There's a couple of ways that a film can affect you. I went back into this film and I promised him before I rewatched it. I said, listen, dude, as, as your friend, I'll go back and rewatch this and I'm not going to have any negative and, and adaptations or anything. And I said, you know what? There's no way I could watch this film sober. And then, you know what? I, But I, you know what I did? I actually went back and watched it sober. 
Oh, and, wow. and, and, which is the second time I've never seen this film under the influence. So, uh, but I will say this: the set I had such low expectations of this film going back into it that I started watching it, and I'm like. I see why I didn't like it the first time. I didn't like it the first time because I wasn't willing to accept, like you say, I wanted ABCD and that's truly what it was. I wanted ABC done. I didn't want you to make, I hadn't yet, I had yet to get into the likes of uh, Shutter Island. Mm -hmm. I, like, I hadn't dove into the Tarantino films of everything doesn't happen in order, but you can still, like I, I didn't know why I knew films, I knew films weren't shot in order, but I wanted them to be shown in order. I wanted to be led. I want you to tell me. I wanted that true elevator pitch of like, you said the scene you hated at the end. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, with that being said, I will say this: this is not a great movie. It's not a great movie to me. But what it is is that it gets a bad beat. It does get a bad rep, and I was a part of that bad rep for years. And I'm not going to be a part of it anymore. I'm not saying that it's it's going to be. If I was at an island, I'd take it with me. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is this: that Cameron Diaz did such a good job, and then to go back and see that the people that they had in the film from Tila Sweden, from Johnny Galecki, from Jason Lee, like you're you're seeing all these names and i'm like what the fuck? they were all in this that's really when i started paying attention like there's no way all these people i follow and watch from from dr strain to roseanne to big bang theory to my name is earl i'm there's no way these people all in this movie sucked so i went back and i watched it again and i gotta say you know what it didn't feel like two hours I was waiting to figure out which part was I so pissed off about. And I and then it brought me back to the first time I watched it. The first time I watched this movie, I was so pissed off because I was waiting for that big, big payoff at the end. But had I noticed, the payoff is what you truly what you call a slow burn. I had been being dopamine had been happening. I can see why that would be frustrating if you're going into it with those expectations. Like, all right, all right. So my goal for watching this movie is why is he in jail? Did he really do it? And then you come to find out like he didn't like do going, anything. Baby, going, there is no jail. Going, baby, with uh, Ben Affleck. So you go into it with that. Like, and again, like you have to remember, I, again, I'm just an actor. I, I was not a writer at the time. I wasn't a director at the time. I wasn't an editor at the time. I'm not, I wasn't doing any of those things. This is me and my, my, what I would like to call my craft out of lessons. I was only just an awesome actor. Out of the womb, I was that. But film is not just acting. Mm -hmm. And so this film... I think t teaches people to understand once you're ready, not to say that, oh man, you just didn't understand it. You got to get deeper. You got to get deeper. No, certain films go be be below the surface. And when they do, they have a responsibility to be true to themselves. And this film did that. And so I have to give this film three and a half f And I know he thought that would never f***ing happen. I know you're marking down this date in history <laughs> in time, but three and a half f Vanilla Sky, guys. Hey, listen, I'm sorry. I, I was hey listen I was the leader in the clubhouse for this was listen but 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 with that being said there are a few films that have been moved up District Fifty One or District Nine whatever it was you're number two oh and number one in my hearts and always will be nobody will ever can change my mind Cloverfield you're still the worst fucking movie of all time before we get out of uh, Thanksgiving in this uh, season we're going to not just give you our opinion but. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes, this is what the world is saying. It holds a 42% average with critics and a 72% average audience score. Roger Ebert gave Vanilla Sky 3 out of 4 stars and Richard Roper ranked it, it the second best film of 2001, his number one being Memento, which I would have to agree with. What did you think of the film? Um, I know that, I mean, you just look at the reviews. This is something that divides people across the board. So let us know in the comments what your thoughts are, why you loved oh boy, it. You're talking about the seven dwarves? Yeah. Hi. Uh, which I still love the fact that you got, you Thank called you. him sleepy. Uh, or you. not sleepy, but sleeping, uh, sleeping Snow Beauty. White. Snow White. Snow, yeah. yeah, yes. The one who falls asleep. Yes. Does she? Yes, Snow yeah. White and the seven dwarves, yes. Okay. Yeah, they just call it Sleeping Beauty, though. All right, it is time for coming attractions. This is probably the most important coming attractions of the season because this is when we get to unveil the movies that we'll be covering this season. Um, as you know, at the end of season one, we put we chose 50 movies for you guys to choose from um, to decide what films we're going to be talking about this season. Thank you for everyone that took uh, the time to participate in the poll. Uh, let's unveil how that translated into our season two lineup. So we gave ourselves two episodes uh, reserved for films yet to be released. So we have 11 episodes this season. We took two away for um, current films. Those two films are gonna be a documentary called The Reunited States, releasing on February 9th. 
And we'll be doing a special extended episode on Coming to America and Coming to America when that releases on March 5th. We also uh, started off with Vanilla Sky, so that left eight spots for uh, you guys to choose what those are going to be filled with. And based on the votes, that goes as such. Number eight was A Time to Kill with 13 votes. Number seven was No Country for Old Men with 15. Lean on Me with 15. Death to Smoochie with 15. Tropic Thunder with 16 votes. Number three is Big Lebowski with 17 votes. Number two was Django Unchained with 18 votes. And the number one, very surprising, I mean, not surprising, but also surprising at the same time, was The Goonies uh, with 20 votes. Which lets you know there is no comprehensive breakdown anywhere on the inter- internets of The Goonies, which is sad after all these years. So and this is us to do it, right? This is, uh, I mean, I'm glad. I'm not, I'm not mad about it. Right. I was just surprised that of all the movies, that one, it was just... Hey, like, man, are you ready? I'll, I'll be doing a truffle show on that episode. It was Rudy. I'm doing a truffle shuffle on that episode. <laughs> Please do. I will. Um, this is where we're going to piss people off with uh, disturbing the sanctity of the elections <laughs> process. But we here... This Are you going to storm the film capital? Uh, they're going to storm this capital because <laughs> I don't know if you guys have like got the notion that this is a democracy. If you did, you are, you are highly mistaken. It's a dictatorship. Uh, yes. We have given ourselves... One veto each to swap a film that was voted on by you guys for a film that we wanted that did not make the cut. So two of those movies that got voted on are going out and two movies are replacing them. So Royal, what did you swap out? I noticed that that you let me say this one because there's no way you're going to be able to sleep morally at night by you saying this. And this was my swap out anyway, guys. Um, I swapped out uh, my time to kill for Doctor Strange. And while those films have nothing the in common in this world is the reason why I swapped it out was this is because we will be discussing the Django Unchained and the Django Unchained will allow me to at least discuss elements of Rosewood which was one of my suggestions A Time to Kill which actually made the list and Menace to Society which was another one of my suggestions so within the Django Unchained I'll be able to, be able to discuss you know bigotry, slavery racism, uh, Jonah Hill for mm-hmm. the first time ever in our show so that allowed me to do that and I switched it out for Doctor Strange because number one I'm a, definitely a fan of a Benjamin Cumberbatch and I also have a gripe with him as well because in that film, uh, see, here's the thing. I'm not just an actor. I'm a voice actor. And they paid this motherfucker to be the lead of the film and that he's also the voice of the fucking villain. And I can be the voice of any fucking villain too. So when I fucking make it, I want you to get this and, and this. This and this. So yes, I'll be swapping that out. And plus, David hates the MCU, so I had to bring yeah, him back. So what you're telling me is you swapped out a Marvelous movie for a Marvel movie, and now I have to go from pretending she's white to pretending it's interesting. 100% correct. And last but not least, I still we're going to be discussing Marvel anyway because Sam Jackson's in The Time to Kill, and he's known as Nick f***ing Fury. I don't know. Gwen, Gwen, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow would have something different to say. She, she never has anything different to say. <laughs> um, my swap was uh, The Big Lebowski. That I took that out and replaced it with The Ten, David Wayne's film. Um, nothing again. obviously nothing against The Big Lebowski. It's an amazing movie, but really, there's it has been talked to death online, and what can we really sit here and say about it for an hour and a half other than it's amazing. It's awesome. great. But, yeah. So, yeah, the, the 10 is going to be a little bit more interesting. It's I'm very interested. I mainly wanted to swap it because, one, my wife is going to kill me if I didn't and didn't get the 10 in this season. But uh, we're actually both very excited to see what your thoughts are on it, being somebody that has grown up in church. This is uh, 10 comedic skits based on the Ten Commandments, so I think that's going to be an interesting episode to get into. Um As a reminder, this season we are switching to bi-weekly format in order to make these episodes more polished and refined. There will still be, uh, there will still be weekly content as we'll, you know, release episodes every other Thursday and every other, on the off weeks we'll be posting highlight videos and um, full-length interviews. Uh, So still get content from us every week, but it's going to be better content, more refined. Um, with that being said, here is the lineup for season two. Of course, we are wrapping up Vanilla Sky, our first episode. January 28th, we come back with Tropic Thunder. On February 11th, David, we're going diving into Django Unchained. 
And then February 25th, we're doing the documentary, The Reunited States. On the 5th, uh, the 5th episode, as I say, March 11th, we'll be doing Coming to America and Coming to America. Yeah, um, that's going to be tough to choose a best scene between a, an original and it a sequel. It won't be. It won't be. Okay. March 25th, uh, Lean on Me. God damn it, I can't wait to go back to Fair Isa. Uh, all right and then on april 28th i will be introducing david into the world of dr fucking strange yep yep <laughs> <laughs> april 22nd is uh death to smoochie i i told you i saw that once but i didn't see it so i'm definitely looking forward to that deep dive on that on may 6th we're going to something that most people will never debate. I believe this has over a 95% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. We're going to No Country for Old Men. And then on May 20th, the 10. And David, he's already mentioned this earlier, guys. We're going to be wrapping up the season with the Truffle Shuffle, the Hey, hey, hey Francis! Hey, Francis! It's a toupee! We're going to the f***ing Goonies, man. Guys, if you're not a fan of the Goonies, don't you just unsubscribe now, and more than likely you never subscribed in the first place. All right, so that is what we have in store for you this season. Uh, we've said it a strikingly little number of times this episode, but be sure to subscribe. Be sure to smack that little bell on the ass so you get notified when we post new episodes. It's only gonna be one. Or it's only gonna be one bump every every week, so you're not gonna get blasted in the ass with notifications by us when we when we post. Um, become a patron. Check out our Patreon page so you get to hear all of the f***ing magnificent mother f***ing sucking f***ing looking f***ing looking? Sure. Ass smoking. Son of a f***ing. All, all, you get to hear us in all of our glory. No beeps. Um, and you get the episodes early. We're not going to promise how early, but they will be before everybody else sees them on Thursday. All right, guys, we will see you We'll see you next week with some highlights, and we'll see you the week after that with Tropic Thunder. Stay tuned, share, like, and yeah, yeah. God is great. Yeah, yeah. God is good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what if, if God, God was, was one of us? us? Just a slob like one of us. Just a stranger on a bus. Trying to make his way home. Why don't you subscribe? It'll last longer.